And a very good evening. It's Sunday the 20th of September. Excuse me, there's just a little cough there. Oh, oh dear. Sunday the 20th of September. Um, it is just gone 8 o'clock. Um, welcome to the ProSynth Network live show. Welcome one and all. Um, I, I jumped in the chat room about half an hour ago and there was um, you know about a dozen people in there already. Uh, so that's really nice to see. Uh, so welcome all of you. Let's do a few name checks. Wagyu, get so many music. Uh, Imperfect. Hello, Aaron. Um, Native VS, ASIO Head, uh, JP Page 2. Uh, Mike Delic, uh, who else have I missed anyone? Uh, Yanisetta, um, if I've missed you, I apologise, my eyesight's failing, um, these glasses are rubbish and I still can't get an eye test. So anyway, that's enough about that. Um, we've got a full house today, um, I'm joined by my regular co-hosts uh, Ben Simpson and Chris, but also we have, fresh from his show, that finished literally 30 minutes ago, uh, he's gone for the marathon. It's Jamie Morden from Geosynths. <laughs> How are you, sir? It's good to see you. I'm doing very, very well. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've just had a, a show with a fantastic guest, uh, uh, Aeson Jelsey um, from Australia. And, and uh, it stayed up as well. It was like half ah, four in the morning for him. Yeah, I but, saw. Wow. <laughs> what an what a, amazing artist. Yeah. You know, his music's fantastic. Sort of, yeah. uh, It's one of those where you listen to and you think, I want to give up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's every musician. So for me, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, forget yeah. it. It's like my son yeah. came in here the other day um, and started playing because he's been having uh, keyboard lessons at school. And he started playing something on here. And I'm like, oh, shut up. I need lessons. <laughs> I need lessons. Uh, yes, yeah. But I caught the tail end of your show, and it was very interesting. It'd be interesting to hear that um, that Melbourne organ uh, once he's done the piece. Mm. Of it. You know, that, you know, that's that's very fascinating stuff. Good yeah, stuff. Definitely. Excellent. Well, we'll come back to you and have a chat uh, about various things uh, a little bit later on. But let's go over to California and speak to Chris, who's over there in I'm hoping a slightly less fiery uh, state of the United States. Is it got yeah, any it's getting a little bit better now. Good. Excellent. For sure, yeah. Glad yeah, to uh, hear it. Uh, with so much synth stuff lately, I uh, kind of took a little break this week and worked on uh, some guitar stuff. So my buddy who had given me this uh, Jimi Hendrix in a box, basically, like a vintage 60s fuzz and a Univibe, it has a really cool uh, thing where the, the fuzz face circuit in it um, has these little cards which you can replace right and so he gave me two cards with it and then i w went and got uh the more cards just the circuit boards and i had a bunch of uh vintage germanium and silicone transistors so i built up some more fuzz faces I gave a couple of to him and so been working on an amplifier and some some projects uh, another pedal that i built here nice. and uh, just doing some stuff i haven't done in a while I uh, you know used to do a lot of repair stuff and modding, but uh, the synthesizers have taken more and more of my life up, so <laughs> decided to give just a little bit. But yeah, things have been going well around here. Good, excellent stuff. Um, so uh, let's cross back over to the United Kingdom, up up north again. Um, this time, because how, how far are you two? Because you're in Blackpool, you're in Warrington. I don't know what the distance is. Is the Crow flies, or, yeah. or what motorway so, links you to? Um, is it the M8? M6, no. isn't M6, it? yeah. Yeah, M6 yeah. to M55. Is it the M55? Yeah, that you, yeah. yeah. it is, mate. Yeah. 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 So, anyway, so Ben, you are looking, yes. um, well, not you personally, but what's behind you is looking hmm. rather good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> you're, you're getting closer thanks to a me. finished article, it seems. Well, yeah. It, it looks good, but it sounds like silence. It does. It does nothing <laughs> yet. But the thing is, is that you can walk round the back now, whereas I used to have to lie on my back mm. with like spiders falling in my face and everything. Yeah. Uh, you can just you can easily walk round the back. So I reckon I can get all of this wired up in one or two nights. I reckon. Nice. Uh, nice. Because because it, it's easy. Yeah. It's just so easy. And then I'm going to set the Jasper's stand up and get me my other synths out and mm -hmm. done that. Well, apart from the acoustics, obviously that's still yeah. <laughs> Need to nail some Split quilts on that ceiling and stuff, or egg yeah, boxes, yeah, whatever yeah. it is that the uh, the kids use these yeah. days. I could do with some of yeah. that, but uh, yeah, there we go. That's another story. So um, a, a week has passed. There's not been much going on, has there? <clears throat> 
Um, <laughs> just a few um, fairly significant announcements of which we will go through. Um, hopefully in a slightly more organised fashion. Thanks to Chris, um, who made some suggestions this week. And so we're going to try and keep things in, in some kind of organised um, fashion, some kind of uh, semblance of, of um, discipline in terms of that. So <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a couple of small things to get out of the way so that they don't get lost in you know the big stuff that we, I guess we will chat a lot about. And I think we all know what that might be. So I'm just going to um, kick off with these couple of small topics. Um, this one really doesn't really require huge amounts of discussion. Um, as you, you know, get ready, everybody get a drink because Rob's going to mention FM. Um, so <coughs> this a few weeks ago, we um, showed uh, some new cartridges from Hypersynth, their new H card uh, for the DX1 and the DX5. But I've been a user for, for longer of um, these uh, carts from Synth Square, who are made by Stefano in um, Milan. And he pretty much, you know, he's designed these himself. He gets these made up in a factory, does a little bit of, of work on them himself. And he currently does these three uh, cartridges for... Uh, the Ensonic ESQs and the SQ80. Um, there's the Roland one, which fits in the, the Alpha Juno, the GR700, the JX8P, the JX10, etc., um, which is a, a kind of a, a replica of the M60, uh, 64C and the M16C. And then he also does these ones um, for Yamaha um, DX15 mark one dx7 and the rx11 and the reason i, I mentioned this is because this has been redesigned um and is available now at the same price as the last one but the main design difference here and i should have thought about this because i can't get to mine at the moment but um on the original ones the cart select uh, dial and the the level and protection switches when you put them into the synth they were at the back so you kind of had to reach around um, to, to see what you were doing uh, now they are on the front there's he showed me some pictures uh, of how he's managed to do that and i haven't got them available here but he's very cleverly taken a little door to board and kind of reversed it around and, and made it uh, fit into this cartridge because obviously he's restricted with the space of the slot that was designed you know over 30 years ago and he's also increased the size, the height of these, so they now stand a little bit prouder and just make it easier to um, to access. So these are available brand new now from Reverb and eBay. As you can see, they retail for about 123 uh, British pounds and some odd pence. Um, and so if you have a, a, a DX157 or RX11 and you're looking for a rewritable cartridge that can store uh, the capacity of 32 original cartridges so there's about 1024 patches on on one of these across 32 banks um yeah they are highly recommended so i promised stefano that i would give that a little plug i'm sure that probably doesn't interest a huge amount of people but it does me um so there you go that's that also um slightly more uh, self uh, promoting and self indulgent is this um so i've been sitting on this one for a little while now this is my interview with Manny Fernandez, uh, who was responsible for much of the sound design of every Yamaha synth from the Mark II DX7 uh, through to Montage and Modi X, uh, including all the physical modeling stuff, the SY77s, uh, 99s, and of course the DX stuff, and the Reface, and the AM1X, and the EX5s. And I think we've all pretty much touched some of these synths across our times. Um, so that was it was a wonderful interview it's all there on the sound on sound podcast page there's some chubby bugger there from england who did that um <laughs> so yeah um please go and take a listen to that it's thoroughly yeah. interesting it really is yeah and let me say also too it's been the best sos interview yet oh, uh, fantastically entertaining we said my other ones were rubbish we said my other ones were rubbish <laughs> yeah okay all right fine <laughs> seriously like uh the from a sound design perspective somebody who's done so much great work in sound design um you know his his mindset and how he got into it and uh, has gone about it was quite fascinating it yeah. was a really great interview and i'm so glad to see that it was it got a full hour for it inst instead of the 30 minutes i yeah. know you had been lobbying for that so yeah yeah very nice work Robbie. yeah thank you thank you very much it has got a lot of really positive feedback and i'm, I'm dead chuffed with that because it is 
Uh, and, and especially from the Sand on Sand guys, because I, I delivered it to them and it was about an hour and a half, I think, after I'd kind of edited all the ums and the ahs and the coughing and that stuff out. And they said, oh, that's too long. And then I kind of trimmed it a little bit, you know, got some, got rid of some of the mostly kind of chit-chat, irrelevant stuff. And it was still about an hour and 15. Um, we managed to get it down to about an hour and four, or hour and five or something. Um, and they said, because they didn't want to chop anything else out. They were that, that happy with it. So I'm very proud of that one. So, yeah, please, if you um, can, go and have a listen. Because Manny's a dead interesting bloke. And he's done some yeah. great stuff. So there you go. That's uh, kind of my little plugs out of the way. I'll talk about FM no more. Um, promise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, guys. We believe you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so I think we might as well kick off with the hardware stuff and then we'll move on to software um, because there have been a few significant announcements. So any guesses as to what the first one might be? It's, mm, it's French. It's part wood, part metal, part plastic. It's um, a morphing analog polysynth. That's their description, not mine. Uh, it's the Arturia Polybrute, um, one, one of the slightly lesser best kept secrets in the business because I think they took one of these to um, to Nam at the beginning of this year and had like a little hotel room where people were you know invited only to come in and have a play and, and some people have leaked a few pictures here and there. I think we all kind of knew this was coming. So um, it is uh, an analog polysynth, a six voice. We will come to that later, I promise. Um, I think we've all probably heard how it sounds, so I'm not going to waste time by going through the video. But my word, this is a rather beautiful looking instrument with a huge amount of features. And it's this, I think everyone's kind of making a big deal about the morphing feature, where it's not just morphing from one sound to another, it's morphing from one set of settings to another. And that's that gives something extra. Um, it's got these um, these really great filters in there, and you've got the you know this kind of traditional uh, multi pad sequencer type thing uh, that allows you to select your presets and, and mess around with the mod matrix and yeah it's just a, a it's a lovely thing to look at if anything else. Um, but you've got the Steiner filter and you've got the ladder filter, loads and loads of controls and. Um, then, of course, you've got this little thing here on the left called the Morphe, um, which everyone's been saying, oh, that looks a bit um, expression E, Osmos type thing. Um, and we'll, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that. And also, I, they, I read the specs initially, and it said um, touch strip. Uh, and I thought, oh, where, where's that? But it's very cleverly recessed and covered with the same kind of uh, wood effect material, I guess, that this is. Um, so it, it kind of is very subtle and it's just I think I think if awards were given out for synthesizer design, I think this one would certainly be uh, very close to the, the top of the list. Um, connections on the back, you've got master stereo outputs, you've got uh, pedal inputs, you've got sync in and out, MIDI in out and through and USB, but no CV and gate, which we can talk about later on. And Stephen Morris approves. That's always nice to see um, when he's not sniffing something rather potent. Um, so anyway, not casting aspersions on, on the wonderful Mr. Morris. So <laughs> let's go round the room, shall we? Um, I know that Chris has some fairly um, firm opinions on this, so we'll, we'll come to those in a minute. Let's, let's do the honour of going to our guest, Jamie. Um, so first of all, what are your thoughts on this? And secondly, are you going to be doing patches? <laughs> Ooh la la! <laughs> it's lovely, yeah. it's lovely. Ah, yeah. I mean, it's like you said. You know, we we, we knew something was going to come for a poly, uh, uh, you know, Arturia synth. Mm. But when it dropped, yeah, it was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And uh, and it is. It's a fantastic synthesizer. It's got everything really you need in a poly synth. Um, yeah, I definitely want to get one. Uh, I'm not really bothered about it only having six voices i mean the profit six the ob6 only have six and you know they're not pianos the synthesizers it's mm -hmm. making it's using sound so but yeah lots of things on there and i said on my on my thing earlier on that you could get like you know mobile phones where they have the silent vibrate mode you could put it on the on the little touche bit and uh, <laughs> have someone call you for like 
really fast modulation. But, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, it looks great. The little morphing feature as well is is quite good, and um, because I I like making sounds where there are two layers, so you're using. Um, you know, you might have a pad underneath and then some arpeggiator on another layer. Uh, but so I could see making a patch on the A, switching over to B, making a patch. But then you've got that whole world in between, yeah. uh, which can be snapshots or there could be modulation destinations. And you get all these different sounds going out. Yeah. So, you know, um, I don't know how much they thought about that, because obviously if you look at the, um, the, the that knob, it's the same size knob as everything else. You would have thought it would make it a bit more prominent, but mm. yeah, fantastic synth. Well, yeah. It's, it, it, I like the way it's kind of like it's right over on the left-hand side along with the mod wheel and the pitch wheel and the Morphe, so it's kind of naturally where your tweaking hand, if you're right-handed, of course, I'm... I think I'm doing our mm. left-handed members a disservice here, but if you if you are, I mean, I guess all synthesizers have those controls on the left. So I guess even if you are left-handed, you would um, you would go that way. And so it's bottom left-hand mm. corner. I get what you mean, though. It's 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 like where is it? Oh, it's that big silver one in the middle. Oh no, it's mm. not. It's it's just down in the left-hand corner. But yeah, mm. I'm sure. I that... If you could use like a pedal, because there's a bit of a more mm. thing on the Nord stuff. Uh, Nord lead A1 and uh, lead 4 and stuff. So you can use a foot pedal for that, uh, for the morphing. So you can probably route it through. As for, um, I've, I've seen comments of people saying, oh, it's what the the mini, uh, the uh, Matrix Brute should have been. But I don't think so. I think they complement each other. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you if you look at the Eurorack world, it is essentially mono sounds that you're dealing with. You're not really doing multi-timbal sounds or polyphonic sounds on a modular. So that's why it kind of makes sense to have something like the Matrix group. Yeah. So I'm not bothered that it doesn't have the CV stuff on there. Yeah, it's a nice to have, but yeah. I just I, thought, it was, I a, I thought it was an odd omission given that Arturia have got a tradition of building these you know key steps with all of those connections in there and that maybe i don't know um i'm sure there's a reason for it um let's go to chris because i know that um when when this dropped uh you know we have a chat like an open little chat room that we all contribute to um on a daily basis so like tomorrow morning something will happen we'll just post it in there and of course this dropped and um I was surprised I will say I was surprised at Chris's reaction and I'm, I'm sure Chris will explain um because I thought he would just be like wow this is fantastic this is great given his work with other six voice polys uh, recently Chris what are your thoughts and don't hold back on the <laughs> on the poly brute well, I, I like it. Uh, overall, I think it has a great sound. Um, some of the videos have shown off some really interesting stuff. Um, I think later on in the Mylar Melodies uh, video, he did some quite interesting and great sound, you know, sounds with it. Um, so my, my only reservation, it, it just seems like there's always, with everything, there's always like one great compromise. <laughs> and all this stuff and so when you think about um you know some of these different synthesizers that have come out and they're like uh, it's great you know but it doesn't have aftertouch or it only has one lfo and it's a 16 voice poly or you know the, you go through there there's always something that uh, well moog one man that's a, that thing's got everything but it costs a lot so yeah. there's always one there's always one cost so there's one thing that that seems to be, uh, you know, kind of uh, skimped on, I, I guess. And to me, it was the voice count for it. And mm -hmm. especially after spending so much time on six voice polys. Now, if you're playing funk or if you're playing leads and basses or arps, like, yeah, you don't need it. You don't need that much. Um, I do. I do a lot of slow BPM music though. And if you're doing ambient or anything like that, uh, the voice count then really starts to make a difference. Now. Um, like with the profit, and I, I, I know D Jamie does this as well. Like you know, there's times when you have really long releases, and it's going to steal notes like crazy. So you kind of have to cover that up if you don't want to make that an effect uh, of this, the the obvious voice stealing. You have to cover it up with a little bit of delay. Mm -hmm. And so I, I mean, I had to do that in some of the patches that I made, and it sounds good. And you can make great sounding music. I, I'm not saying that you can't make wonderful sounding music. Uh, because uh, I love the OB6, um, I love the Prophet 6, and I love uh, 
my my Juno 106. The Juno 106 is the worst though because with the uh, the sequential and DSI stuff, you can have it last note priority. So when you hit that new note, it's there. But when I'm playing the Juno and I've run out of voices and I hit another note for this long chord, I'm like, oh, what's what's happening? It's not doing anything. Mm. So. I, I was just a little bit disappointed uh, by that. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to stop a lot of their sales or anything, but it just seems like in 2020 for a flagship poly that like eight voices t- seems to be kind of the place where um, given, um, you know, playing full voice chords, um, you don't have a lot of voice dealing with eight. Like on the system eight, like I don't have that problem too much. I mean, there, there's a few places, but I, I wished it had been two more voices at least. Um, but again, I said, that's, that's what I would prefer. I do. I'm not doing really fast music, um, techno or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So for my needs, I, I just felt like I would rather pay a little more and have the two extra voices or, or even wait to buy it, to save some money and, uh, to get the thing that I really want rather than just to always to be that one little cost. So aside from the voice count, very interesting synthesizer. Um, very cool sounds. I'm sure that they're going to sell a ton of these, you yeah. know. And for competition-wise, I mean, it, it's put it's put in a nice range to... Uh, at first, people were talking like, well, is this going to be a Moog 1 kill? Well, not for what it can do. I mean, it's different. It has some really interesting sounds, so it would be a good compliment. But I think they're more... Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Marshall, for not doing more techno. <laughs> <laughs> I do metal. Is that okay? <laughs> but, um, you know, hitting the, the competition with Dave Smith uh, and uh, the UDO Super 6 and the Summit, they're all, you know, somewhat plus or minus $500. So it'll be interesting to see how that um, uh, plays out in mm. the market and what. And of course, there's a rumored Dave Smith instrument coming out soon. So I don't mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Ben, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm somewhere in between. You know, it, it's uh, I'm I'm excited about it. I, I'm not that bothered about the the six voice thing. I'm really interested in in the possibilities of the morphing. I think that's it's like Jamie was uh, saying. It, it 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 could even be like multi modulation dest- destinations all clumped into that couldn't they and then you modulate them off so you just you're just tweaking certain elements of the sound the sound isn't completely different from the you know sound a isn't completely different from sound b but as you as you modulate that morph all kinds of multiple elements get modulated at the same time which is it's a really interesting thing i'm surprised nobody's done that before really to, to that level you know that's I fancy using that myself. So I think, I think, it, yeah, I would probably get one um, when when I'm back out gigging again and earning cash. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, I'll be thinking about that. I probably got more chance of getting one of them than a Moog one. Yes, um, it's, it's certainly <laughs> it's uh, certainly more, more people's price range for sure. Um, let's yeah, let's talk yeah. about the Morphe because uh, a lot was made of that. It's an interesting um, uh, device. A lot of people initially, myself included, looked at it and thought, oh, is that uh, like a version of the the Touche um, from Expression E? Is, you know, what's going on there? Has it been a collaboration? Because I believe uh, um, they're they're both French. I know, obviously, Arturi is uh, the guys behind the Touche. Are are they French? Is that me just, you know, um, assuming because they call something Touche? I don't know. But anyway, I thought that's what it was. And then a lot of people then start saying, oh, look, Arturia have ripped off um, the Touche. And then when you look at it, they haven't really, because the Touche is much more complex. Um, you know, it's this kind of thing. It's almost like on a, uh, a gimbal, isn't it? And it's, you know, you can vibrate it and, you know, pressure at different ends does different things. And whereas this is simply X, Y, Z, or for our American friends, X, Y, Z, um, with this, you know, this touchpad, which is clearly, you know, that's been done many, many times before, and just the vertical pressure, which you can assign to, I guess, a whole bunch of stuff. So it really isn't 
in my certainly from my own say it's not an uh, an expressive e or um uh touche it's its own kind of thing but it's it's interesting and i think it adds another element because my eye was drawn to that and i thought oh no modern pitch wheels and then i saw them above so i thought okay well that's good so it's it's an added thing and i kind of like yeah. that i think that's that's yeah. fantastic and i, I don't think yeah. it's a rip off i think you know a lot of people are saying oh they've ripped them off i, I, I don't think it is i think it's just well inspired axel by me hartman, that axel hartman designed it didn't mm. he and he's yeah, a yeah. member of, of the group so we we could ask him <laughs> we could we could ask him what what, what the, the the design brief was maybe one other mm-hmm. thing that really I, interested me uh, about this is this which is the software controller stroke editor so this isn't available unless you buy the synth you only get this when you register the synth it's not a plug-in um sorry per se it's not a you know it's, a, it's not a part of you know the v collection or anything it's not the synthesizer it is just an editor uh, librarian and and controller but of course what it means is that you can load this into your door and fully automate pretty much all of the parameters of the synth within your door just by you know tweaking you know this on here and it just gives that extra element of control and i have a soft spot for synths that are built with accompanying products such as this um what Absolutely. are you guys what are your thoughts on on that oh man after spending so much time on the uh profit six lately i'm so glad to see a company that will actually design their own software for it that that part of the process drives me nuts if there's mm. not good software to go mm. with it. And I, I don't like with uh, with DSI stuff. Like I'm not sitting with my OB6 and moving and moving with my trackpad knobs. But I like having that open um, both for the librarian feature, but also to see where things are at because on the synth itself, it's not it's using pots, not encoders mm-hmm. for most of the things. So you can't tell where things are. So looking at the screen and having that kind of visual feedback for it is very helpful. Yeah. I mean, with a Mo- Moog one is, is one, and maybe the Hydra synth, are synthesizers where they have such a well-designed UI that you don't really need an editor. I mean, the Moog one definitely doesn't need an editor. The only, the only thing you could probably do is like uh, just see everything at once, but it's so easy when you're working in a section to see what's on the screen and they give you a nice screen for it. So. I'm, I was I was really happy to see them do that. And that's yeah. that's great. Now of course they do a lot of software, so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, just going to make your life easier, Jamie. Yeah, I mean I think it's um, I'll just echo really what Chris is saying. It's great that they've come out with that, and it comes out at the same time as the synth, rather than waiting mm. further down the line for some third party to maybe do some kind of an ed- editor. And the editors for me, how I use editors is a. I hate naming patches on the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That knob. To, oh, God. I did, it with the, I, I did it with the Rev 2, and I nearly lost my eyesight for two weeks. So uh, <laughs> so uh, the, there was that. Was that helpful. But also modulating, you know, mo- modulation routing is so much quicker to see everything in that yeah. snapshot. Yeah. And um, and also, you look around, and you think, oh, you know, some items that are in the menu, and, and it's all up front. You think, oh, yeah, I haven't used that. So yeah. um, there's, th- there's that. But, yeah, I mean, I think I Overall, I mean, going back to the touche type of thing, mm-hmm. but my sort of when I made the patches for the Moog One, it's got that little XY pad in there, and it's yeah. so expressive to be able to change the sound. You got your aftertouch for one thing, and then the XY and the the pressure element to control something else, and it just brings another dimension to the sound rather than you know something like you know at the minute I'm working on um, uh, doing follow up patches for. Uh, this the prologue yeah if you can see that but um and there's one lfo and it can go (laughs) to one of three destinations and you can only use one of them yeah so you know you've got to use the oscillators to create the change in in movement in sort of sound and there's no aftertouch and you've got a mod wheel and that's it so Mm. yeah it's um having all these uh expressive elements on on this one synth that's fantastic. Yeah. I'm really, re- I will get one. I'm sure will. But uh, yeah, I bought this new Mac, so yeah, <laughs> that might have to wait a while. <laughs> yeah, indeed. No, I, I, I'm a big fan. Of, I mean, you know, if a company like IK Multimedia or Modal can do these great little controllers, uh, editor controller apps um, that mm. that slot into your door or or just work mm. as a standalone, you know, if you, maybe your your Uno or whatever is over there 
and it just allows you to just tweak it on screen as you want to. It's, it's yeah. just so much easier and nicer. And there's a librarian and, and dump, you know, you can dump patches to and from uh, the synth, yeah. which I think is great. And of course, if anybody's going to do it, Arturi have got to be able to, it must be the best because they produce the software and they have been doing for 20 odd years. So, um, yeah, it's, it's I really think cool. also that um, there's things you can do with software that you don't have to bake into the synthesizer itself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, while I like creating patches myself, um, I've read a lot of people who enjoy, like when they use the uh, sound tower stuff and they'll use the, um, what's it called, when it, uh, random generator. Mm -hmm kind of stuff where or it'll take two patches and it'll combine them into a new patch yeah and so a lot of people use that or they use it in their DAW for automation mm -hmm. in a connection so to make things easier so there are some nice other purposes that really expand the functionality of it um you know that you don't need to bake into the hardware of the yeah. synth and that, it makes it easier in certain you know certain sense it makes it easier to program um, because it, when you get um, things like uh, what was it called, Sound Diver and MIDI Quest and all of those kind of multi synth editors, as it kind of sounds like what you were saying before. You know that there was always something that those editors were bad at. You know, it might not have always been the same thing, but they weren't, they weren't great at editing all yeah. synths. They were great at some and not yeah. at others. And so if you mm. unfortunately had maybe two or three synthesizers that one editor was really great at for two of them and then. The other one was great. He had to buy both to kind of get that, that experience. But if companies produce their own dedicated editors, build them as a plug-in so that it can be used in the door as well. It is just it's everyone's a winner, I think, on, on that one. And, of course, it's free with, with Arturia. You know, you buy the synth. That comes free. It's not an extra thing that you can um, you have to do. Uh, Marshall commented in the chat room when I threw this picture up. Um, he said, oh, look, a cheese grater next to a chopping board, uh, which I thought was rather amusing. <laughs> Uh, I have got one disappointment with the uh, the poly brute, mm -hmm. and I, I wish that the panel came up like it does on the Matrix yeah. brute. Yeah. That, that was a, that was a bit of a mistake, I think. I was expecting for that to happen in like in a demo video, and then I thought, oh no, it doesn't. But you know, uh, it's yeah. For... Wouldn't it be great if they had like an automated one? You push a button and then the panel oh. just goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's another five hundred oh, quid on the price, isn't it? Something like that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that'd if you look at the, the, the specifications, I mean, we've spoken about the six voices of polyphony. Um, I'm I'm of the same opinion that eight really should be that you know the minimum for a, for a poly synth. It should be that, um, but you know, six isn't awful. It could could have been worse. It could have been four, I suppose. So. Um, <laughs> Lots. I wonder though if this has been in the pipeline for years though, uh, around the same time Profit Six and that came out, they could have been working on it for a long time. So that could be one of the reasons why it's stuck at six. Yeah. But also as well, if you look at like um, say like the Profit Six or Ob Six, the voice cards are these little tiny sticks like RAM sticks. Yeah. Whereas if you look at the voice boards on a Moog One, they're <laughs> huge monsters. So yeah. It's 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 interesting uh, to see what it would be internally. For creating all those voices. So the the review in, like in Sound on Sound, because um, they <laughs> this is how it all broke, was that this got um, uploaded to the Sound on Sound website and somebody found it and started sharing it around. I thought it was a hoax. I generally did because mm. I thought, I, well, you know, I, I I've heard that this thing might exist, but yeah, and I, and I went on there. And, um, I have slightly privileged access to their site, and oh yeah, it's definitely there. And it's coming, so that that was a real thing. But um, I'm just trying to find it. Now, this is this is great, isn't it? Um, so there was a, a bit in here that um, Gordon Reed. So Gordon Reed did the review, and Gordon Reed is a well-respected um, synthesizer user, owner, aficionado, uh, uh, pretty much everything. But um, I'll paraphrase him because I can't find the, the section. But he did ask Arturia about the voice count and said, look, you know, what, what gives? What, why only six? Um, and they said that effectively it was a balance between uh, building something that was going to be affordable and building something that was going to deliver, you know, as much as they could. And six was kind of like, you know, the, the balance point. So that was their excuse. Um you know, whether that's just marketing faff or, or not, I don't know. But 
it's not the end of the world slightly disappointing but i think everything else kind of outweighs it um i kind of wonder i I don't know what you guys think but interesting right after this breaks that uh i don't know what was it like two days later or i don't know something like that the uh behringer uh pro 800 which I, i mean given that paragraph that that you know you had sent it over to us that very specific thing about him asking about yeah. arturia's reasons for it and the reasons that they did give and you know um that then you have arturia or uh, sorry behringer come out with a very small compact polysynth that has two more voices it doesn't need fans it doesn't need a big uh heat sink oh, um it doesn't cost that much it was six it, you know they announced it was going to be under 600 dollars us i i can't help but think that that was them kind of poking at that a bit mm. you know like you, yeah you know there's got to be really i mean I've, i just found the paragraph here so um i will uh quote and this this is gordon reed writing in sound on sound so um he says nonetheless i still wondered why arturia's engineers had limited it to just six voices so i asked they explained this came down to a combination of the physical size of the unit and pricing we chose not to build a machine that would be beyond the reach of most and as a result we had to choose what seemed essential and what could be more limited six voices seemed to be what most people would be comfortable with and we focused on three primary axes of development. An analog voice that sounds pleasant with most settings, expression and morphing, which was a priority from the very start. We preferred to design the Polybrute with six big voices rather than a greater number of small ones. In other words, and this is Gordon, this is back to Gordon speaking, in other words, we could have had an eight, 12, or maybe even a 16 voice version of the Polybrute, but it would have been huge, heavy and unaffordable, and it might have been necessary to discard all manner of facilities to make it practical. What's more, and this isn't something mentioned by Arturia, uh, but his own observation, I suspect that it would have uh, required fans, and the Polybrute is mercifully devoid of these. So, um, you know, it's take it for what you will. That's their explanation. We're not going to get anything different. It is what it is. And at 2 2, uh, I mean, the street price is 2.5 euro, but I think UK is 2 2 something, and I think US uh, is, is somewhere between the two. It's, it's a lot of synth for the you know for the money. I think I think it's a mm. a reasonable price point. Um, it's yeah, not... there's a lot there's a lot of synthesis on it. That's yeah. the thing. Um, mm. You know, you tend to have that type of level of synthesis on a monosynth, but mm. uh, that, you know, with that modulation and uh, uh, the, the matrix and everything, it's it's they've clearly set it at profit six ob six kind yes. of market, haven't yeah. they? And yeah. um, and that's what the, and they've sold you know bucket loads. So um, you see them everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, you know, they've done it right. Yeah, it would be great to have more, but it depends. I mean, I, I, for me, I need to really get my hands on one and see what, what yeah. it's like. Because, you know, some some sense, you know, the oscillators are so huge, like monosynth oscillators, that anything more than, like, playing five notes and you've got two oscillators each, ten oscillators playing it, it's just like, you know... It's too much, yeah. It's too much. So yeah, I, I spoke so... with Mark Doty because Mark had one um up front and like everybody else um you know they were all subject to the embargo uh, that arturia placed and then they kind of say go and everybody posts their um polybrute review videos and you know there are some good ones and there's some not so good ones mark's one mark's doing what mark does and he does it slowly mm-hmm. but surely he does an intro first and then he'll do like a dozen you know looks you know so he'll look at the filters then he'll look at the lfos then he'll look at the morphing and then he'll do, look at the morphe and what have you um and i said to him go on voice cap what's your thoughts and he said i've spent when i I can't remember how long he's had it but he said i have spent all my time with one hand playing keys and the other hand doing stuff because it's such uh such a design that that draws you into shaping and messing around with the sounds he said "I, i don't have enough hands to play it so you know one hand's playing notes and i've only got five fingers and the other hand's making adjustments and so i haven't really noticed it because i'm just you know messing around and having so much fun so you know that's his initial thing but you know as as time goes on when you want to start playing big you know with more than six voices it might start to to bite you on the bum but well, anyway. that's the thing i mean i mean chris you know with the with the matriarch that you know you've tried to play a chord on 
on um, using those oscillators, you have to have them so low down in the mix, mm. each oscillator, otherwise it just overdrives it way too much. So, uh, And some synths I find are very, very weak, um, and th the more voices, more oscillators work well. Uh, Rev 2 is a little bit like that. Um, but then you've got uh, other synths that are just like, you know, in your face with the oscillators. So... It'd be interesting to to hear, but yeah, it, it was strange seeing all these. Uh, it seems to be the thing now where every, all these reviewers come out with the videos at the same time. Yeah, um, I'm not so sure I like that. I, I kind of like um, mm -hmm. the staggered, and then you know you, you mm. end up watching them all rather yeah. than all oh, right. And, yeah. and, and that was a point I think I made on release day. It's just like oh my god, I've just a glut of you know all these notifications saying you know yeah. poly poly brute video. And you know some you know some go into huge amounts of detail and, and some don't and some you know some vary, and I feel for them. You know, and I, I spoke to one or two of these people. I said, yeah, what do you think about the fact that you know you get this thing maybe two or three months ahead of everyone else? You have a chance to learn it, play it, make your video, and you want to make it special. And you want to make you know make it an an here here is my video. But you're tied to the embargo, and you you can't yeah. release it until say six p.m. whatever it is on on the day, and then you get the message from Arturi. It's like go. Everybody else does it, and everyone gets lost yeah. in the mix. And I think I think um, Sonic State and Mark. Yeah. Mark how Mark does these things staggers yeah. that will keep the audience coming back. Exactly. And the Sonic State did a little video, and they're going to do a proper review. That is the best approach, I think, rather yeah. than just. Because like you end up just looking at some of them for a little bit, and then just like oh well I've watched that I don't need to watch yours. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my Lars was really good. Um, that really went went into to a bit of depth. Yeah. And of course, Luke Pop. I mean, he's just like a video manual, isn't he? So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, and and I don't want to kind of go off on on this tangent, but I I do want to say that you know you can, I'm I'm put off by people who make videos, and that's that's what they do is like a their main thing because there's a formula and there's a thing and i'm not it doesn't feel sincere and heartfelt i want to hear emotion it's part of the job though isn't it it is it's marketing yeah it's part of the job you get it with everything you know you only need to look at things like the i know it's a tangent this but uh the sort of tech reviews they all have the same colored background with mm. the purple and the blue and yeah. you know it's a format and i guess that's it's just part of the industry yeah isn't it, I, suppose, I just but, i guess i'm yeah. old school i just like somebody like nick bat you know just rattling off mm. um you know a, a stream of consciousness like oh my god look at this i can do this yeah. rather than you know something that's so you know planned and and perfect it's you know i, I like imperfections so and that's well, why i'm well, looking nick, forward to marks more than nick anything. does it from the point of view i suppose that we would when you yeah. first come to a synthesizer so he's kind of doing the uh, the first impressions for us a little bit yeah that's it that's why he works for, sorry that's why he works really well and then if you really are like you know into the nitty gritty of uh, the details, and that's why you, you jump over to loop pop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 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 there's a place for that. There's a place for you mm. know when let's say in six months' time I decide yeah I'm going to buy a poly brute, and I get it and it's on my desk and I think right do I sit and flick through this manual, or do mm. I you know play around and you know learn you know just by searching myself. Or do I get a video up where I can say, right, how does the LFO work? Well, there it is, because it's at 17 minutes and 30 seconds. I can just jump to Ooh. it, and it tells me about the LFO. And and so yeah. you know, it's like, a, you know, Lupop does video manual. So he, you know, his is quite a niche thing. Um, two, but, two, two points real quick. Um, you know, somebody that does um, walkthroughs that I really enjoy is Ben, uh, who's in the chat room, Div Kid. Mm -hmm. Because it's informative, it's interesting. He has a very creative mind to show you what's possible. Um, you know, especially with his uh, uh, Eurorack modules, he's one of the guys that I continually find to make just fantastically good videos. Yeah. The second thing, co practical question. So one thing, you know, we're in awe of the uh, Poly Brutes Mini. You know, it's it's huge matrix and the wave folding and, uh, you know, especially the uh, Morphe has been talked about. Um, with something like the Morphe, um, how much do you think you would use it in your music practically is what I'm wondering. Because as uh, so just I, I'll, let me play devil's advocate for a second here and say um, 
this is something that looks like when you play through presets at at uh, Sam Ash or Guitar Center or whatever, uh, or Tomans or whatever, like that. Wow, this is really cool what it's doing. And but would it be the type of thing that would make it into your music, or how much? How do you see? Um, how do you see it being used in your music if you are interested in a, a polybrew? Well, uh, gonna, how would I'm going to say throw that to Ben? Uh, but I was just going to ask, how <clears throat> how does your door understand what's happening with that morphine? How is it? Uh, how is it sent? What what kind of information is it? And well, I think the more is it like some is... kind of MP MPE or something? Or what, what, what? Well, they, they they say that um, pretty much every controller on the the Polybrute transmits uh, MIDI data. So. Um, I guess the Morphe is the same. I mean, the Morphe is just it's, it's just an XY touchpad, and this Z plane, you know, sprung push yeah. thing. So it's a, it's pretty simple, I guess. I I think I would I would use it because when I got the Hydra synth, it, it just I I, I wasn't uh, prepared for the amount of. Uh, enjoyment I get from using that polyphonic aftertouch and, and the strip mm -hmm. it was just I thought oh yeah I might use this you know the the, the bonuses mm -hmm. but it, it's really part of the instrument that and uh, and I think that that's what Arturia's tried to do with with, with this on the polybrew I think it's it's like an integral part of the perform mm -hmm. of performing on that instrument I mean, I, um, I I look at the like the the Korg Z1 or the Prophecy, which has uh, Z1 has the XY pad, um, the Prophecy has that log wheel with the ribbon thing on there, and it's it really is an integral part of how you perform with that instrument. I can see a bunch of polybrutes going for a Burton like this as somebody presses a little bit too hard on the morphine and it goes <laughs> flying across the stage. Or someone sticks their point on it. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, <laughs> did it, did it, wah, 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 get that point off. Yeah, so I, just, I like it. I, I'm, yeah, I, th I think it's great. I, th I, I like those kind of expression type things because it makes it sound different and it also, you know, it can help, you know, just change it up and make you know everybody's not necessarily using it in the same way so anyway mm -hmm. look we spent a lot of time so, on polybrute but so chris you were going to say one last thing oh no i just i just wanted to hear from jamie also so uh sound as as in your sound design how do you expect to use it uh with the more the morphe feature like well, what do you I envision mean, it, well it, it depends i mean uh the moog one um has got those extra type of controls and end of the day expression has always been the thing that's been a bit of a tough nut to crack with with synthesizers hasn't it mm -hmm. uh in using you know it's either after touch or or pitch bend and a modulation wheel or two if you're lucky so having these extra things is great now I, how i approached I mean, Moog hired me to do the Classics Bank, and I tried to reuse the XY pad in the same fashion for each patch. Um, so sliding from left to right would alter a bit of filter modulation, going upwards would uh, open up the cutoff. So I'd probably use the XY pad, uh, the, this touche, whatever it's called, <laughs> um, in the same sort of way. Uh, and map certain controls that maybe aren't that are going to make your hands leave the keyboard a bit more or something, mm. uh, or things that are a little bit under the hood, um, or even you know the morph knob is that size. I might even just have the morph knob just control that thing controlling the morph. So because uh, it's a bigger area, you'll get more of, of a detail, and maybe if you can freeze certain parts of it as well, mm. you can just quickly jump from one place to another um, with two different fingers instead yeah. of moving a knob. Uh, yeah. So that might be um, how I'd approach it. Mm. Okay. This, I'll tell you one thing, though. This is the, the first synth this year that's made me really disappointed that Synthfest isn't happening this year because Arturi would be there with this and this would be where I'd get my hands on one to, to really you know understand it and, and see whether it's something I'd like. Uh, Ben's gone invisible, by the way. Um, so there you go. That's the Arturia Polybrute. Now, Chris mentioned that another piece of hardware has uh, appeared on the scene. Um, Ben's just come back just in time. He's got his beer in hand. Don't shake it up, mate. Uh, so um, the other piece of hardware news, and we're, we're going to um, use Gear News's website here because I'm fed up of just using Facebook 
because Behringer never do any announcements on their website. Um, so Behringer reveal the Pro 800. So we knew they were working on this because they have got um, this guy called uh, Gligli. I don't know if that's pronounced uh, correctly. I think it's a soft G, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Le- so like just Lee. Okay. J, like yeah. a J. Okay, yeah, so fair enough. Um, but yeah, we knew that they were working on something because they'd mentioned that they'd um, kind of hired his services because of the stuff that he'd done um, with uh, Profit 600 modifications and expansions. So this is the Profit Pro 800, which is an 8th voice polyphonic analog synthesizer based on the 600. Um, it uses the the kind of the, the now Behringer standard uh, desktop box that I guess can also fit into a Eurorack case um, if you put the appropriate um, fixings on there as well. Um, not a huge amount of details. Um, eight voice polyphony, two VCOs per voice, and presumably, as they say here, VCFs and VCAs as well. Um, the oscillators offer sawtooth triangle pulse and pulse width modulation. Filter and uh, VCA get their own ADSR envelopes, and a noise. We also get a noise generator and glide control. Um, looks to me like a, a cracking little synth. Um, they've used the membrane buttons um, from the original. Uh, on on the left there, there's, I think there's one or two extra little functions they've added. Um, somebody mentioned somewhere on the internet, oh, it looks a bit messy. Everything's not kind of, you know, it's all over the place. But actually, when you look at it, it's got this kind of diagonal design, and it do, does to me. It just it it looks fine. Um, it just makes sense. Um, <coughs> from the back, it looks a little bit like that. So you've just got um, what's that? I guess that's audio and uh, headphones. Sorry, is that headphones and then input? I don't know if that's an input on there. And then you've got some some of these dip switches and a MIDI in and a USB and then of course your PSU um, or your wall walk pl- plugs into there. Um, thoughts on the pro or the pro eight hundred the profit the pro eight hundred Ben. How about uh, we kick off with you, mate? Yeah. That- I heard the uh, the same about the the design being messy. Why the design and the synth that look like looks like that now, but it it looks like the Prophet Six Hundred. That's that's yeah. why it looks like that. Um, it, it's got the same little numeric pad, and uh, I, I think it looks great as a, a retro piece of kit. And I'll I'll definitely be getting one of these. I think. Yeah. But this is what I said, and then. Uh, Pete Steer, who's a friend of mine, he said, why, why do you want one of those? You've got a, a Profit 6. And it's like, yeah, I suppose. It's just that I like the Pro 1 so much mm-hmm. that I want a polyphonic version of that with memories. You know, it's 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 a, it's a great it's a, it's a great upgrade to, to that synth or addition to that synth, should I yeah. say. And they're saying they're trying to get it under the $600 mark, um, yeah. which would be nice. It, it's a bargain, yeah. Yeah. Um, Chris, your thoughts on this? Oh, yeah, I think it looks great. Um, uh, again, the style, it, it just calls back to the uh, Pro 600. And uh, is that what it's called? Is it Poly 600 or Pro 600? Pro- Profit 600. Yeah. Profit yeah. 600 yeah. was the original, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, I've never played one, so I don't know how much different than the, uh, it will be compared to a Profit 5 or a Profit 6. Um but for under six hundred dollars, that sound, I don't have the money to put out uh, for one of my own right now. So, you know, something like this is at least a little more uh, in the sights. I, I, I agree with uh, Wagyu on here, and I think it would have been nine. I, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad that they added the two extra voices, so it's eight voice. And I agree with Wagyu that the mono out is kind of a bummer. I would. The only thing I would if I would criticize it about is it would be great if it was stereo out with a, a pan spread control uh-huh. and that's something that mm-hmm. it sounds great on the profit six and would be great yeah. to have on here one extra knob on it yeah. yeah but still you know if if they hit that 600 buck mark um for an eight voice polyphonic analog synthesizer that's mm-hmm. not, you know when we've just been talking about a two and a half thousand one yeah um I, six Yes. Yeah, and again, I think that's why they probably, I mean, it's not done yet. Why did they choose to post about it again? We've seen it before, and I think it was to kind of poke at yeah. Arturia, because this is a lot of value right here. Obviously, this doesn't have anything 
you know, compared to the the polybrute in terms of modulation. So in in that way, it's not it's not a, a fair comparison. But for somebody looking for an analog poly with VCOs at a yeah. at a very good price, that's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, I think I think the uh, the Behringer announcement will make a lot of people it will affect our curious polybrute sales i think i think that's why they made the announcement there because they're thinking oh I should have spent two and a half grand now or i'm gone for a bit for another two voices for a lot less money but you're getting a lot more synth with the polybrute than, yeah. than you are here yeah, and it's like they say the big voices as well and it, it you know it's it's probably going to sound in a completely different league to to this uh, Pro 800. Yeah, Jamie, what are your thoughts on the um, the Pro 800? Well, I'll just echo it. Uh, what everyone else said, really. Um, um, what's not to like? I mean, remember, eight voices in your Eurorack system. That's pretty mad, isn't it? Really, yeah. uh, if you think yeah. about it. Um, so you can use, you know, poly sounds with the, in your modular, taking that out. You know, uh, I suppose Diff could know more, a lot more about all that side of, side of things. So, yeah, I mean, I, I got the Pro One, and I did a, a, a video. Where I sampled, I made loads of samples off it, and loads, and did a poly sort of. I did a track out of it, just the one um, Pro One synth mono. So, and that sounded good. Uh, multi track, so this thing together, um, you know, with eight voices, just slap a bit of chorus on there and a bit of delay, you're, you're in happy land, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm really excited about this one, um, and I'm still waiting for the for their monopoly, um, or monopoly, uh, however mm. you want to call it, whichever That's good side of the yeah. And I'm, I was really looking forward to that, and then it's just gone really quiet. And mm. I thought I was tempted by that. Now I'm tempted by this because, um, despite you know what most people think of me, I, I would like an analog poly synth in here, just you know, so I, I can cover that bass um, because I got mono stuff. So it would I, I'd like to be able to play chords on an analog, on an analog synth. A genuine you, you've synth. almost got the FM side covered. Uh, yeah, I'm just, not quite. A few more, just a bit. Yeah, yeah <laughs> not quite. In fact, there's one since last week that's uh, sitting behind your head there, isn't there? Yes, there is. Well, it's not so much a synth; it's a controller. But uh, yes, um, there is. There is now a, a weighty KX88, which I have um, I have fallen very much in love with um, since I got it yesterday. Um, but you know, I, I want a, a poly analog, and so I don't have a huge amount of money because I spend it most on on this digital shit. Um, so two and a half grand for a poly brute, it's good price for what you get, but 600 quid for this or probably 500, you know, maybe, um, that's an easier way of getting something like that. As long as it sounds good. I mean, obviously we, nobody's heard this yet. Um, and as Simon has just pointed out, you know, where would I put the bloody thing? I mean, you know, the, the pro 800 could sit right here on my desk. Whereas uh, a poly brute. That's well, so important though. The room. Yeah. The room aspect, we've, you know, we, with all these great synths that have come out in the past six, seven years or so, we've bought them and, uh, you know, our spaces have got smaller and smaller mm -hmm. uh, to, to put these synths in. So while, it, you know, one camp will say, oh, why don't they put a keyboard on it? Why don't they, you know, uh, room, you know, uh, they can just slot in your studio, Robbie. Uh, straight away, you know? yeah. So uh, you know, or just if you got your rack, get a little six U rack brute, depending on the the power requirements, and slap a couple of them in there. Wow. Yeah, I um, did, you know, I, I rearranged this whole room uh, a few months ago, I think it was, and and put that that whole rack in there, and I thought, I'm that's it, perfect, everything's fitted in, and and we've got, mm. and within like weeks, I'm like, oh, I need more room, I need I need more it's stands. Ne it, it, it's never it. I, I don't know quite the, the I don't know whether the the depth correction or anything it, whether the perspective but I've got very little because I've put this here just so that I can play with it but it sits between me and that rack and if I move my chair too much this is going to go for a burden and it's going to take the CS6 out um, and and this is 27 kilos it's a beast yeah so I'm, yeah. I'm like what do I do with this because you know it's massive um, it, I think it will fit in that because I, I purposely bought the, the the wide fit jaspers because i got one or two things that needed it um but i don't know what to take out to put this in 
So it's a lot of weight from one of those poles, though, isn't it? Do you think? Do you think? It'd yeah, be okay? it would. It would need the support because that is. I mean, yeah. I thought the DX5 was heavy, but the DX5 is absolutely fine on there. But this would just. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I, anyway, that's another story. Oh, um, sorry. One thing I wanted to ask. Mm. Sorry, going back to the previous thing. What do you reckon of those four wooden legs that come? Oh, oh, yes, of course. They're awful. They're, they're absolutely awful. What's that all about? <laughs> if they had produced, if this was like a Nord stage or, or a, like a Nord Electro, which was, you know, a, or a Yamaha YC61, which is like an organ stroke stage piano thing, fine, yeah. looks okay. But on a, on a big analogue polysynth, or, or, you know, it just doesn't look right. I'm just trying to see if I can find a picture, but I can't. Um... Somebody said it in one of the, the Facebook groups. Uh, they, said, uh, they asked, do you think those um, four stands would work on the Moog 1? And I said, <laughs> you'd need four tree trunks. Yeah. They'd have to be made out of, like, carbon fibre and, and yeah. stuff. No, yeah. you, you, you need your instrument with uh, its own legs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, this is nice. a uh, 1955 Fender lap steel. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah, and I can't find a picture of those legs. That's where you got the idea from, then. <laughs> anyway, yes, so there you go. That's um, the Behringer. Um, uh, the, some people are calling it the, the Bro 800, uh, but the Pro 800, um, which is due apparently sometime in January with a price of hopefully around 600 bucks. Um, so that, that'll be interesting to see. And uh, see how I, I'm looking forward to hearing it, uh, and then we'll make some decisions. Um, right, so that's that's the hardware out of the way. Um, last week or so, we've been covering some teases from Strymon, and eventually Strymon have um, made the announcement. And the announcement is that they've released a new pedal, and it is called the Night Sky, a time warped reverberator, um, which looks very nice and purpley bluey and kind of thing and uh it has yeah it's kind of like a built-in sequencer and stuff i haven't really i'm, I'm not into my pedals as, as as much as say chris is so i'm going to defer to his expert um opinion on this your initial thoughts on strymon night sky chris well, um, I, I think as far as uh, both guitarists and synthesis out there, that'll be a huge hit for them. Uh, it's the weird kind of, um, you know, a, a little bit trippy, unusual reverb pedal. They, you know, people love their reverbs. This does some really unusual stuff. And uh, this is the type of thing that, like in the guitar world, those section of guitarists, we're not talking about the, you know, Les Paul and Marshall guys, but there's a lot of guys that are doing ambient guitar music now, just like huge pedal boards, and they go nuts for this stuff. And so, I, uh, you know, I'm kind of curious to see what the synthesis will, you know, keyboard players are going to do with it. But I know at least in the guitar market, it's going to be crazy because there's not a whole lot that's like this. I mean, think about the things that we like about the Poly Brute or about Euro Rack stuff, those... Um, being able to manipulate the sound in those kind of ways, uh, that's, you know, being spread out across, you know, all these different instruments. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's for me. I, mean, I love Strymon. I've been playing Strymon stuff since the beginning. Um, uh, in fact, I was the one that got them to put more drive on the Deco. <laughs> right. And uh, because that was originally released as a more accurate tape sim, but it's it didn't do a whole lot so it was fun to see them uh, kind of implement that but uh, in fact uh, going back I had uh, maybe I mentioned this last week I had the original uh, several of the original damage control timelines the big green boxes with tubes and stuff so one of my favorite companies um, I'm gonna probably pass on this one I just don't need it I've got enough plugins to that would cover anything that's like it uh, but for guys specifically using hardware I think it's gonna be very popular Although I am a little disappointed, the Volante is beautiful, I have that, but I think I prefer the other original, larger style pedals that they did with the menu. You're able to do a little more things with the menu and see what's happening than 
than something like this. Yeah. You know, like this, this only gives you 16, what is it, 16 presets or something without... 16 accessible off the front panel, I think, and then up to 300 yeah. via MIDI. And I just don't really want to deal with that on a guitar pedal board, no. so... Well, do you think that Strymon and now maybe, uh, or maybe they have already been thinking, well, actually, you know, our market is much wider now. Um, you know, lots of synth heads are getting, really getting into our stuff. Um, maybe... Sure, I mean, they have a, their foray into uh, Eurorack stuff with mm -hmm. the Magneto. Um, a number of companies that, like, I was surprised to see Maleco, um, some of their uh, Eurorack stuff, because I'd, I'd seen their stuff for years in guitar pedals. I'm like, oh, they're making synth stuff now, too. Mm. So, yeah, it's a very smart thing to do to uh, widen your market and where wherever you can find some sales and uh, do some crossovers. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Definitely. Jamie, are you a Strymon user, Strymon fan? Does this thing tickle your fancy? It tickles a lot of things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, I love Strymon stuff because especially, uh, I've got the big sky and I've got a timeline and uh, I had some of the other little pedals that I, I, I did review years back, but um, I prefer Strymon. They were a lot more transparent um, when they're on the sound. You can still hear the core sound uh, as well as, you know, the shimmer. I find Eventide a little bit too much of a, um, a colour sound a little bit too much. Mm. Um, I don't know if this will play, but this is a very old sound with a bit of Strymon. Can't hear anything. You can't hear it. It's, it's oh, that right, good. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, some addition. When I first looked at it, I thought, well, I've got a big sky, so do I need anything like that? Mm, probably not. Mm. Uh, but then the more I looked into it, the little sequencer side of stuff that's on there, uh, that you can freeze the reverb, and then you can use the little sequencer that's built into it to change the pitch of that. Right. Um, how practical that would be, I don't know, but it's it's a good. Um, I, I think if you haven't got a, a big sky, this would probably be. I would have got this first. I think. Yeah. Because um, it's more upfront in control. There's no messing around with menus. Mm. So um, yeah, yeah, seems good. But it's a lot of money, isn't it? Really, and end of the day. Yeah. How much is it? I didn't. I think see. it's about four hundred and oh, something blimey. plus dollars. Yeah. So it yeah. usually works out the same in in pounds. Yeah. So, um, so it's right there against the big sky. Yeah, definitely. Ben, are you? Do you think reverb pedals and effects, you know, little boxes like this, are now becoming more like instruments in their own right? And I think so. I think like with the the modular crew as well, it's all integrated, isn't it? They have these these setups with effects and the patching cables everywhere. I, it's not really for me because I, I just like everything set up in its place and mm. I like recalling things by the computer and I think that's a a, a little bit old school for me. I, I, I'm just not, I'm not that type of person to be rigging things up when I need them. I just need everything yeah. to, to work when I want it to and I need it to be computer recallable really. Yeah. Um, but they do sound fantastic. I've got, uh, I've just got like a couple of hardware effects, but they have to be USB and yeah. they have to be link linkable to me door and and everything unless I start freaking out with like an OCD thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the sound quality is fantastic, but uh, I don't think I'm going to venture further than Valhalla really no. for my no. <laughs> for my effects. I'll stick with the uh, stick with the plug-in versions. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because um, the other effects news this week is this kind of um, reverse move from Eventide that have gone from a plug-in to a piece of hardware, which is the um, the black hole. Um, so this is now available as uh, as a pedal. Um, uh, trying to find, I couldn't see the price. Um, somebody might be able to enlighten me. But yeah, they've um, they've brought the black hole into into the pedal world. Um, is is that does that make it more usable to anyone here in this in this room? Uh, uh, I mean, for me, it was. I think it's around two hundred and seventy quid or something like that, right? Um, or similar in dollars or whatever. Um, I 
I first saw this and I thought, well, I've got H9 paddle, pedal, so why would I want to do this with one algorithm? Or um, so, but yeah. then again, there is the hands hands on control and a little bit more. It's a strange move because they've released a lot of um, iOS effects and things yes. like that. And of course, we, we all know everything on iOS is cheap. But of course, <laughs> do we ever use them? I don't know. Yeah, but um, I know I don't. <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, it's 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 a strange thing. I don't know. Uh, maybe I mean they've got this even before the H9. There's the separate pedals, isn't there? Mm-hmm. The ones that are, I can't remember what they're called now. The reverb and the pitch yeah. one and the other one. So it's a it's, it's time unusual. Factor, thing. Mod time, yeah, those space. ones, and they yeah. were they're really good. Um, and they've got the the algorithms multiple rather than just the the one. So I don't know. It's a strange move, but mm. maybe there's a market for it. I don't know. Yeah, well, I won't be there must be some. I mean, these things don't get created unless they they think they can sell enough of them. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah. Chris, um, you're the pedals guy, really here. Yeah. So I I have I think two <laughs> of this <laughs> algorithm. Uh, one on the Moog one and one on the H nine. Mm. Um, same as Jamie. Uh, I'm not a fan of Eventide Reverb. They just don't do it for me. I uh, I really use Valhalla the most. And then if I'm u- if I'm playing guitar and I'm gigging, I use Strymon because it's hardware. Um, and I think that they first and and if anybody knows in the chat room if they've used the Black Hole algorithm before the Eventide space, I, I'd be curious. So they came out with. The time factor, the mod factor, the pitch factor, and the space pedals. And eventually all those al- algorithms got reused into the H9. Then those got ported over to iOS and to the computer, uh, VST, and now it's kind of coming back around again. So it, it kind of feels as a company, they don't, I, I know they've invested a lot of time on one of their um really high-end uh, processors that just not something I'm interested in. I don't know what the details are, but um, yeah, it's kind of like, well, we're just doing the same thing around and around and around. And I know that there are a certain amount of people that are devoted to the black hole sound, but it, it just never done anything for me. Mm. And like I said, if I really, really needed it, I would do the, um, I would use the H9, I guess. But yeah. just compared to even something like super massive or or any of the Valhalla stuff I would never choose it over that sure. but that's my taste and and there are a lot of people both both synthesis and guitarists that love the space so I suppose as you know like I said to have the hands-on control it make more sense to me like on my pedal board like because I hate I have on my small gigging I have a really large pedal board and I have a small one where I use a small pedal board I have an H9 on there because it does so much and it's kind of the jack of all trades so i have some stuff that's like my staples for my sound but then maybe i'm going to need a tremolo which i don't have a dedicated pedal for Mm -hmm. so i'll dial that up but then you know i'm getting the phone out in the app and that it works great but there is something to be said about just you know turning some knobs right away and having something happen yeah so yeah definitely yeah so um even tide black hole just curious, actually, Robbie. Mm. Robbie, for your your FM synths, what's your kind of go to effects then? Well, I, I tend to because I don't have many hardware effects or any hardware effects really, and that's something I, I need to um, to address at some point. Um, I tend to stick things through um, through software, and you know, I like the the free Valhalla stuff. That's that's nice. Mm. Um, what else do I use? I mean, it, just even the stock. Um, plugins in Logic, you know the, the 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 reverb in Logic is really nice. I like the UVI um, uh, reverb, which the name has escaped me. Um, Spark Verb, that's it. Spark Verb and their chorus, which is called Forus. Um, I like those uh, from software, but I I I, I do wish uh, the only hardware effects I've got are the, the ones that are built into my little Behringer deck. Uh, that I use for this show and that I only bring out when we have Simon Alexander on the show but I know he's in the audience so we can go (laughs) Simon's Infinite Synth Cave Um, and that's it (laughs) but uh, what I find especially with the FM stuff because obviously that really needs effects to bring it to to real life the setting I have permanently generally on on this here is um, a chorus and a reverb blend and, and that just really kind of does it and then if I want to expand and go 
goes silly, then yeah, it's I'd break out the Valhalla's or even Reasons um, Reverb, the oh, is it RS seven thousand, whatever it's called, um, which has got all the convolution stuff in it. That's really nice. So. If you were going hardware, though, you'd have to get like a Rev One or something. Wouldn't well, you? It, I'm looking at yeah, Rev Five or Rev Seven, SPX ninety, um, Native yeah, VS. Yeah. Um, uh, apparently, might be able to sort me out with one of those at a very affordable price. Uh, he mentioned a few weeks ago, so I'm just waiting to hear. Um, but yes, yeah, I would. It, it would have to be something that that matched. I'm sure. Um, so has, has yeah. there ever been a plug-in of, of the Rev Five or anything? Not official, no. The Yamaha. Right. No, they've Yamaha have that, never really done good. plugins, have they? Um, I don't think. It'd be nice if they did with those. Though. It, it must oh. be doable. They must be able oh, to port that yeah. algorithm over into software, and I'm sure there's quite a nice. Sound. I'm sure there's a there, there must be a, a software plugin somewhere that models the, you know, those because yeah. they were big, you know, back in the, in the day. Um, yeah. So talking of effects and stuff and some of these I, I use some of these as well but um ik multimedia have um announced a new effects uh system stroke collection i guess uh it's called mixbox and um i've been actually playing around with this um this week not not hugely but um yeah it's all the effects you need in one rack so they say it uh, retails well it's normally 299 uh, euro but uh, it's on offer at 199 at the moment um, it packs 70 award-winning mix processors and creative effect effects derived from the T-Rax, Amplitube, and Sample Tank uh, packages into a convenient 500 series style plugin. Uh, create, compare, and save your own custom channel strips or multi-effects chains, uh, or choose from over 600 presets to give your creativity a kickstart. And it really is this, as you know, you, there's there's this kind of stylized graphic here. It's just all of these effects and more in these small compact little interfaces that when you load up the plugin you get um i think you can put eight into a strip um something you know something like that and they're just quick and easy and immediate and you know it's just like you know i wanted a chorus and a reverb so i just um clicked those and dropped them in straight away i've got a nice chorus and a nice reverb which i can just tweak to to taste um, there's all sorts of stuff in there, such as you know these these things that give you like vinyl crackles, and uh, you've got the channel strips and the filters and the EQs, and the, you know there's various um, convolution reverbs and choruses and modulation effects. And what I really liked about this, having played around with it, is the immediacy of it. Now I come from a Reason background. Um, that's you know, often you know where, where I used to do a lot of my stuff and the one great thing about reason is that you can just like drag and drop stuff into the rack and it automatically connects to everything that you need it to and it's there and it's instant and i can get kind of instant gratification if i then want to go back later on and you know tweak and maybe swap this reverb out for a different plugin or whatever i can but i can just drop a whole bunch of stuff in really quickly get you know ballpark and, and work with that and that's what I liked about this because I just opened it up in Logic, threw it in there, got an instrument, threw some of these in there. Oh yeah, that's good. And swap if you if you want to swap it, you just drop down the menu, click it, swap it over for something else very quickly. It's just quick, simple, intuitive, rapid. You know that, and I really like that. And of course, it's modelled on you know all this stuff that you get in T Rex and Amplitude and Sample Tank, which are very good effects. Um, so I really, really like this. Um, anybody else got any thoughts on this one? And put your hands up. Well, when you first announced it, I, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was a hardware thing. When you said all these effects in one rack, I thought it was like a, a, a rack-mounted doodle, and I thought, oh, that'd be great, right? If it works with the computer and takes some of the the, the, the processing duties off off your main door. And, yeah. And runs it all there, but from what you've said, it still sounds interesting. I, I think, yeah, I, I'd probably be interested in that. It, um, so it seems like a lot of effects for the money, and uh, provided the quality is good enough, yeah, it, it, good value. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, if you look at the uh, what what's included, let me just get the uh, the screen up here. So there's nine amp models, five distortion models, ten filter models, three saturations, three channel strips, seven dynamics, seventeen modula modulation, 
effects, three delays, four EQs, nine reverbs. And they're, they're not, you know, individually outstanding, but they're best of the best kind of thing. Um, and I say they're, they're derived from, uh, I mean, I've, I've been using T-Rex for a while now, and, um, you know, they're derived from that, and they're really very, very good. And I just like this whole concept of it, you know, being in a rack. That, that appeals to me. Um, yeah, given my my kind of background with with reason, um, Jamie, you got any thoughts on these? I d I did go through a, a a period where I was mad on um, guitar pedals, and um, I got one of these. Uh, it was a Digitech RP three hundred and sixty, which was multi effects, and the software controller for it looked like this type of thing. You saw the image of the pedal, and you could reroute it to yeah. pre pre and um, post and all that type of thing. So it reminds me a little bit of that. But yeah, having it in software, the fact that you know, like Ben was saying, having things to recall um, is, is one of the benefits of it. Um, I I tend to use one one kind of secret weapon, I suppose. Uh, well, not not secret, but a uh, guitar rig. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, just yeah. turn up, just go for the effects and that, and you stick synth through that, and there's all these sequencers and all this sort of stuff, and even shimmer. Um, so yeah, I, I I haven't really used any of um, IK stuff, at the T Rex or anything like that. Um, probably because I suppose at first maybe things like amplitude were uh, directed to to people playing guitars, not so much um, mm. synth. So um, not to say you can't use it that way. But no. uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in it, but um, I don't know. I mean, isn't there something like these little pedals built into Logic already? I seem to yeah, recall. I think, yeah. I don't know if they're yeah. any good or not. I don't know. I don't think I'll bother with them. But yeah, I mean, how much is it anyway? Uh, well, it's it's list price is two nine nine euro, um, but it's currently at one nine nine as an introductory price. But you can also there is a demo uh, version that you can download mm. and try. So um, it's, you know, I think when you compare it to the price of T-Rex, which can get, especially if you go for the Max version, that can get quite mm. expensive. To get that kind of degree mm. of quality um, in in this and, and all of the kind of variations that you've got, sure, you don't get all the, the detail that you can go into, but you get uh, like, you know, it's, it's kind of like, the, you know, greatest hits of T-Rex, I think, uh, you know, or greatest mm. hits of IK. Yeah. Um, like in, in the box, and I'd say it's that immediacy that I really like, Chris. Um, I know you're a fellow IK multimedia fan, you like this? Yeah, I, I like it. I, I was kind of it's been one of the products that I have expected them to make, but uh, you know, it's just now release it because they have done so much work in uh, Amplitude, Sample Tank, T Rax, doing all the stuff. I, I always thought it was odd that you couldn't use the effects cross-platform. Mm. So, for instance, um, I'm a huge fan of, of Leslie Rotating Speakers. Uh, they sound great on organ, but I love them on guitars. Yeah. And so they came out with their Leslie stuff, but you had to buy two different versions, If one if you wanted to use it in Amplitude and one if you wanted to use it in t Yeah. And that always kind of bothered me. Now, I, I bought the, the Amplitude version, and then I ended up getting the 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 T Rex version in a group buy, so I I eventually ended up with both. But um, their effects sound great, uh, you know, all the vintage modeled guitar pedals, the CE one and the Small Stone, a lot of classics in there for for the intro price, which will eventually come back around on sale too if you miss it this time, mm. you know, of one forty nine. It's like you said, it's a good value altogether. Um, the one complaint that I have seen and that I also have is that I have, I think, all of that except for maybe three things that they have put new, like the cassette tape one. Mm -hmm. and I don't remember. So I've got all these things already. I'm paying $150, or actually, I think because I own some stuff, it would be $99. Mm -hmm. I'm paying $99 just to be able to use it in that way. And for me, it's like, ah, I've, I don't need that. And so if it were $49, mm -hmm. and it, because I have already have all these things purchased, like maybe I would pick it up just for the convenience. And again, I, it's, the sound quality is great. I like the way this works. Like you said, it's a great simplified rack. You can save, you know, chains of effects yep. like that. But um, for those of us that have most of this stuff already, it ends up not being such a great value. So. Yeah. 
and half the stuff that I would use it on would be guitar anyway. So I've already I already got that. So yeah, that that's kind of a, that's the only critique that I would have about the the model of how they've released it. But as a product itself, I think it's great, and I mm-hmm. do recommend it because if you need some effects, their modeling of of uh, the gear has been pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, you can't really fault the quality of of what they do. Um, whether you appreciate the yeah, say if you've got T Rex or you've got Amplitude, whether this is going to work for you or not, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I got this this week and and really enjoyed that kind of immediacy, which I think I've said numerous times. Um, so yeah, that's Mixbox from from IK Multimedia is out now. You can try uh, try a demo um, if you want to buy it. It's currently on offer for uh, one hundred and ninety nine. Uh, euros and 99 cents whatever that works out in your local region um just do this quick one here a couple of quick ones really um because what i want to do is um want to get back to our sample and hold feature which we introduced last week and we had a a topic from uh last week that kind of hung over which was all about midi routing and what you know what what do we do for our midi routings and stuff so we'll do that um, we'll also discuss um, controllers as well because that's something else that was uh, raised. So before we do, um, this one has come out this week. This is interesting. I want to get Ben's take on this specifically because um, he does or has done film soundtracks and, and stuff like that. So this is uh, our friends at Sample Logic. Um, they've released their third version of Trailer Expressions. So I don't think you really need to to know what this is going to be but i shall play some of it anyway it is essentially um you know all these kinds of uh sounds and 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 things that you you will get for for trailers you know big drums and whooshes and bangs and crashes and stuff So again, this is you know it kind of follows their 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 way of rapid development of things uh, in terms of their, their cinematic sample libraries. Um, so it's just like you know really very quick to be able to get something that's usable. Um, they've even got you know uh, Jean Michel Jarre here to um, to give them a thing. I didn't really think he was into making trailer music and and stuff like that. I think he was well above that sort of thing. But it's a you know, very simple interface uh, that you can see here. It's you know it's um, just a few knobs here and you know energizers and polishers and, and you can just craft your own kind of um, sort of you know two minute trailer music with this kind of thing. It's on offer at the moment. It's half price. It's uh, normally two hundred bucks. It's down to well ninety nine ninety nine. But you do need the full version of Contact. I'm afraid this is not like some of their other stuff. They've started doing this more. I'm afraid and I think. This might again be down to Native Instruments whole licensing thing. Um, before a lot of their stuff was playable using uh, the Contact Player, which came with it, so you didn't need to have Contact. Now you do need the full version of Contact. Um, that offers on for another week and a f- couple of days. Um, ben, so you're you're our guy, our resident movie um, scoring guy. Um, could you see yourself using something like this? You're muted. Oh, yeah. Can't hear you, mate. Where's he going? that? There you go. There. He's back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Uh, I could... I, I thought it sounded brilliant. I thought it sounded amazing. And, and anything that speeds up the process, the creative process, is a good thing. The only thing that worries me about it is how many other people are, yeah. <laughs> are using the same thing and are we going to... I mean, we've already got to a situation where every trailer you watch goes like... Boom, yeah. Every, <laughs> every single one. Uh, um, so I, I think it, while it's very useful, I think lots of people might find it useful and we get lots of things sounding the same. So, so this, um, is, this is an instrument that kind of replicates what we're already used to. Now we're going to get loads more people doing what we're already used to. Is that, yeah, is that, yeah. 
Yeah, I just think that's that's not great. I think uh, probably some of the most creative stuff I ever did was when I was using a P8 top, yeah. uh, a Yamaha S Y twenty two, and a bike. A bite wheel, you know. Like, <laughs> I, I was trying to make a movie soundtrack with with, with that stuff. Yeah. And um, if I had those tools at my disposal, it would have obviously sounded much better. But that was me trying to deal with the situation. Me trying, and it, it was uniquely mine. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I, I, I think it sounds great though. And yeah. I, I, I would use elements of it in it but I would be steering clear of just using that because sure. it's going to sound the same as everybody else's yeah. don't want to dwell on this one too long because we want to cram some other stuff in but uh, Chris, Jamie one, one question yeah. uh, would you be able to win a competition from Spitfire Audio with these <laughs> sounds <laughs> oh, uh, you read my mind though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean I yeah. have to say that I've I've got a few of Sample Logic's libraries uh, that they've sent to me for review, and it's not my kind of thing, but what they do is good. And uh, you can see yourself very quickly creating something useful uh, in, in those kind of genres, you know, cinematic trailers or scoring, that kind of thing. It's, it's kind of like an ideas machine. Um, and I've never been a fan of toolkit things, you know, uh, because you end up, everybody start, you know, they're, they're, there's going to be stuff in that toolkit that's really good, and everybody's going to go, that's good, I'm going to use that. And then we hear just everybody using that thing. Um, but I suppose if you just want to, you know, rapidly, you know, knock something up, this is this is perfect. And yeah, does this float yeah. your boat, Jamie, or is this kind of pass you by? I, I suppose it's for, you know, if you work in that industry of making soundtracks, then, you know, it's not necessarily really what, you know, you get paid for doing music, not the sound side of things. So mm. if you've got a, a, a director saying, I want it to sound like this movie, which sounds like every other movie, then you, it's a go to. It's it's there's yeah. no there's little effort there. But mm, of course, yeah. you know, um, you know, you get paid for writing the music, not as I say. So, yeah, for that people in the industry, it's a, it's another library to slap on with the other libraries. But yeah. it's um, I mean, this, the quality is great, but it's it's just nothing new, is it? Really, no. we've we've heard it all in the old. Uh, was it in Native Instruments that there's a whole load of them? Uh, Impact is it or something like that? I don't yeah. Know. But it, they're all the one key thing. Boom, 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 boom. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, they sound great, but yeah, yeah. for me anyway, it's, it, it's, I don't do that. That's what we had with the when the Korg Wave Station came out in the nineties. Like, yeah, every movie or TV soundtrack was was yeah. a bed yeah. of of Wave Station, wasn't it? Because there was just those yeah. those great presets that were in there. So yeah. it's probably plinky, just plunky, 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 yeah. plunky, plunky. <laughs> That's it. And then uh, just, I, I would put together different ones. Like, can we now start combining? You know, when it comes back around again, like digital native dance into Shimmer. Yeah. With these kind of, uh, 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 Tycho percussion. That's it. Finishing on a, on a fur like arc stab. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, so that's Trailer Expressions 3 from Sample Logic. It's available now. It normally retails at 199 is on offer at the moment at 99 uh, If that's your sort of thing, I'm sure that will float your boat. Um, so before we go and do uh, our little talky thing, I just want to share these with our viewers. Um, no comments uh, necessary here. We don't need, need to discuss this. But this Ben brought this one to my attention. The Probably the most unfortunately named instrument from the Steinberg stable uh, the four knob pop D. The hell's that? Apparently, four knobs with endless possibilities. Um, hello, four knobs with endless possibilities. <laughs> um, sorry, a visual gag there. Um, but yeah, apparently, this is um, a piano. Are they rotary uh, coders? They're, <laughs> yeah, they're four rotary direct attitude <laughs> modulation and reverb. Um, but it's yeah, it's. Just, uh, it's I don't really know what to say about this. It's just a piano library, but honestly, four knob pop D. What the hell? Um, another uh, funny thing, and again, this. Oh, so we're going to go back. I, I saw this and I, I loved this. I thought this was amazing. This is an advert from Yamaha from about 1985. It's Donald Fagin looking really weird in a house playing on his Yamaha gear. He's got like like pretty much everything from the X series circa 85. He has a 
a KX88, there's a DX5, there's a QX1, there's a CX5M, there's an RX11, there's a TX816, it's all in there. And he's just like weird looking, you know, staring out of the window, Gary Newman style. Um, is that what your neighbors see? Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm going for oh, Pete Don yeah. Fagan. <laughs> yeah, I should take that and just put it over by the window and just stand there all day looking at it <laughs> like the guy from Sparks. Yeah, I thought that was quite amusing. Um, so anyway, let's go back. Um, so Sample and Hold was a, a feature we introduced um, last week, and it's, it's where the audience threw uh, stuff at us. And we had such a packed show this week that we haven't invited new suggestions. We will do next week. But we, we had one hanging over, or a couple hanging over from last week. So I thought we can spend these last 25 minutes or so uh, discussing those. So one of those questions was, um, how do you root MIDI? what's your midi routing you know protocol what do you do how do you daisy chain do you have multiple hubs all over the place with direct connections for every instrument what's your thing um let's start with our guest jamie what's what's your um kind of uh how do you how do you connect everything up there uh it's all usb hubs and i'm really surprised it all works um <laughs> I've got hubs everywhere, mm. USB hubs, and they all, they all, and the great thing, obviously, you know, with a Mac is the fact with in the MIDI routing page, the audio MIDI settings, you can see everything yeah. visually, all your MIDI. So it's majority of everything in here is USB, so they all get their own dedicated set of channels. Um, and I use a mixer; everything goes into patch bays and then into. Um, I've got three Presonus Quantums, the Thunderbolt ones. And um, so I have something ridiculous, like 80-odd plus channels mm. live at any one time for every single synth. I have got a couple of old bits, though, uh, besides myself. Um, <laughs> I've got a Cheetah MS6 and a Roland D110, and that's just using an AMT8 and uh, that oh, yeah. USB, and it all kind of works. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, do you have... Yeah, USBs. Are... Yeah, so it's, it's just what? like USB MIDI hubs that you Dot. have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, you... No, they're just um, just USB. Um, oh, so you're just using the USB, got, MIDI. USB. Yeah. Okay. USB yeah, extension it, cable. Most of your synths are, are modern, aren't they? So they, they are. Yeah. Yeah. The USB the yeah. connector on them. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I've got. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you can see this. I'm gonna gonna go mad with the, the camera. Uh, I, I've got uh, a Mo2. Can you see it down there? I'm trying to show Let's you. Let me uh, get you on a full screen. Then, nah, it's a bit dark, mate. Is it too dark? Yeah, it's just black. I've got it. A... Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've got a, a mode to uh, MIDI Express thing, uh, and then this uh, weird MIDI face, 16 by 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was only cheap. But like Jamie said, I, th I think that the the OS, the Apple OS, it's got brilliant yeah. uh, routing possibilities within that or on its own. So two of them, mo like like Jamie as well, that quite a few of my synths are like direct USB connections. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can route everything where, where pretty much where you want it to go just through that on its own. It's... It's a good setup, really. Yeah, Chris, how about you? Uh, probably pretty simple compared to you guys. Um, I've got two main. Uh, here's one of them. <laughs> 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 uh, so I have a Focusrite Claret Eight Pre uh, Thunderbolt, and it's got. Uh, so I I run. Um, you know, I'm running four stereo into it, and uh, we've got a few things that I want to have always plugged into it. And then on the front panel, I have two slots for, um, like, I've got a AKG 446 or mm -hmm. uh, 414 uh, there that I use for vocals or or other microphones for guitar cabinets. But um, my MIDI, I, I usually do that if I need to, to put something in. I try to track stuff as much as I can just by hand. Uh, but there's some things that my keyboard skills need some help on. And especially if it gets to be a little more 
piano-y. If it's more synthy, I'm okay. But if it's more piano-y, then I might need to go in and edit something. And that's where I'll, I'll either pull out this uh, DIN cable or a lot of them, like the OB6 um, or the Moog one, I can just do USB straight into my computer. And that seems to be the easiest way to do it that I found. So, um, yeah, not not complicated, not sophisticated either. I do have a hub that's uh, so my big synth rack that used to be always be behind me um, has some other synthesizers and a mixer on it, and that's all routed in here. And I've got channels going to it, and I can actually. Uh, do the same thing like if the OB6 is over there I can still do USB but I don't really sit, like to sit and play it over there or stand mm -hmm. so if there's something I'm going to be doing a lot of re recording parts on I'll usually bring it to the desk and then just plug it directly into the computer or into the interface yeah um, so I oh blimey so for, for a very long time I had um, a Yamaha UX256 um, which I thought was just like the, the be-all and end-all of, of um, interface. So it was USB into the computer, and it gave me six in, six outs as pairs of MIDI sockets, MIDI DIN sockets. And then it also gave me two TG ports, which Yamaha and Roland, I think, I can't remember if anybody else used them, but they were like serial, um, round serial connectors. Cog. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, and they, um, I think they kind of, they were big around the time of general MIDI because uh, a lot of the GM modules uh, had them on. But the, the great thing about it is that, you know, this one small cable can access the full capability. So you could, if like with my Roland Sand Canvas, which was um, 32 channels, so you had like A and B, it can address both of those uh, with just this one cable. So it it was, it, you know, saved me having, you know, four MIDI cables that could just have this one but I had this weird thing, and it's only recently that I've kind of like smacked myself in the head and say, why the hell was I doing that? Because I had this thing with every instrument must have its own in and out port into the computer. So I had the UX256, and that was pretty much full for, you know, until I started buying all this stuff. And I needed something else. So I bought the, um, the ESI um, MU, what's it called now? The M... Uh, M8UEX, which is this thing. Let me just see if I can get this up on screen. I mean, this has been a revelation because it really is um, uh, an incredibly capable device. So you've got 16 MIDI DIN ports on there, and they are all either inputs or outputs. They automatically detect whether it's going to be an input or an output, what it's connected to. So it just gives you so much more capability. So you can have... 16 um, MIDI outs, if you want, or 16 MIDI ins, or any combination in between. But it also, on the back, uh, if I can just bring up, um, get this image full size. So on the back, you've got three USB ports as well. So you can use this to, to connect um, MIDI, uh, USB MIDI uh, stuff as well. So you've got this host port, and it operates off of bus power. Um, but you then get uh, the um, the dreaded ground loop, so you you best to, to connect it to the mains as well, and then you get rid of that. You know, it's not drawing the power. But that's been an absolute revelation. So I've got one of those. Oops, zooming in there. Uh, I've got one of those. Um, I've got the UX two five six, and I also had like a little Emu um, X MIDI uh, two in two out thing. So I had all this stuff going over, and then I thought, you know, why? Well, I should be daisy chaining this stuff. I mean, most of my stuff is you know is not MIDI. Uh, sorry, USB MIDI. I think the only thing that I've got is obviously the little tabletop stuff, the MS one hundred and one. Everything else is is traditional US. Uh, sorry, traditional MIDI. So uh, I have to have you know the the old fashioned stuff. And I thought, well, why don't I just daisy chain it? So a couple of weeks ago, I think I might might have mentioned it last week. I I linked all of this you know the DX and TX and QX stuff on a daisy chain. So um, the QX is the heart of it, and the DX7 goes into that, then out of the um, uh, the QX into, the say, the DX11, then through the DX11 into the SY22, through that into everything else. 
and then you just need to set MIDI channels and you you're fully using the protocol and you just you're daisy chaining all of a sudden I've got these spare MIDI cables oh I don't know what to do with these um, so that's really interesting to, to kind of get back into that old way of doing things uh, but yeah I mean I'm, I, I really need to think about rationalizing my, my MIDI connections and of course um, I've been using these Bluetooth MIDI uh, plugins you know the WIDI masters which are absolutely brilliant. I mean, I got that KX88 yesterday. I thought, oh, I'm not going to have to go and dig cables out. Oh, no, just plug in that. Boom, that's it. It's all you know connected to whatever I want it to be, and it's you know latency is, is virtually non-existent. Um, well, I was going to ask you about that, mm, what, what the latency is like on those things, because they look great. Yeah, it's they're, they're stunning, absolutely stunningly good. It's the latency is there's obviously latency that there has to be because Bluetooth introduces it, but it's down to around three milliseconds, so it's it's barely right. you know barely perceivable um, at all. Um, obviously, the further away you get and the the more obstructive you know, the the line of sight, then you you, you might uh, encounter a little bit of stuff. But you know, in this room. It's perfect, and and that's great. You know what I've been able to do is because the QX3 has got two MIDI outs, I can connect one MIDI out with a cable to the hardware that's in the rack. The second MIDI out goes on a a, a Wi-Fi, uh, sorry, a, a WIDI master over to that side of the room where there's another WIDI master and that hooks up to that. It just pairs up automatically every time I turn them on, and then I can then go from the through socket of one of those and carry on daisy chaining so it kind of leapfrogs the gap between the two mm. rigs without having to have an extra cable so that's a, another great use of it so it's um that's kind of you know changed the way that i've looked at, at doing it but it's i i know i can rationalize and i've also got this the, um an mep4 which is the midi effects processors that yamaha did where you can put one in and get four out and mess around with the sounds and i've just picked up an akai um, ME thirty P two, which is the eight port MIDI patch bay. So I'm going to try and route that into there somehow and see if that can simplify the process. But yeah, I, I, I have a thing. It's like I love working MIDI routings out. It's just I don't know whether it's something I developed as a, a young age that I really kind of got interested in hooking all of this stuff up and making it work. And when when it does all work, it's like yay, brilliant, <laughs> love it. So there you go. So that hopefully that answers a uh, question. I think we've all got slightly different ways of doing it. And I think you just kind of have to um, pick, you know, depending on your gear and stuff. I, I mean, I've got USB hubs coming out of my ears like you have, Jamie. I've got one under here, which is like a 10 port USB hub. I've got another 10 port underneath that rack. I've got a seven port that I've strapped to the back of this iMac because, you know, I've got iLocks, E licenses, uh, the 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 reason keys in there. I've got like one, two, three, four external hard drives over there. Um, I've got MIDI stuff, USB like the Craft Synth and the Sculpt and all that that uses USB. So I've got all these hubs. And I, I, you're a Mac user as well, Jamie. Have you ever noticed that if you like, you know, you start everything up and you think, oh, I didn't turn that. USB hub on you know like a couple of hours after you started and you turn it on that it craps out some of the other stuff and they they eventually come back after a minute or two but it just like disconnects everything it's like so it throws a bit of a fit have you ever had anything like that yeah yeah loads of it and um there's uh, uh sometimes you'll be chasing trying to get something on so you, you know you're looking at the um the, the routing thing in, in on your yeah. your mac and uh you the prologues like this actually they're working on it it, it just if you took you have to turn it on after everything else is turned on if you turn it on first and then build up the computer it'll never see it yeah uh, um, so yeah usb is glitchy as hell isn't it really yeah. um and can be but yeah i mean i've got things rooted through it and i'm, I'm just surprised it works but <laughs> um but then again i don't really just you know just play out loads of synths all over it. and my thing is sit here make sounds goes on the shelf something else comes on um that's my kind of my thing yeah um so but yeah wouldn't it be great though like uh, old wireless microphones you know where you, mm. you, you well ben will know this obviously for gigging and you got multiple microphones just having like a rack mount thing receiver, 
with loads of those like witty master yeah. things or whatever, or even yeah. built into the synth itself, some, yeah. some wireless, yeah. but transfers MIDI and audio. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, yeah. Why aren't we there yet with our flying cars? I'm that? sure it will. Uh, uh, hey, we're still stuck on six can... voices, so like, <laughs> you know, on that for a while. You can forget your flying cars. I'll take the wireless gig any day. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I, um, that, that's the only bad thing or, or slight downside to those witty masters is that they either connect um so what happens is when you power one on it will sit there waiting to connect to something so either you turn another instrument on or device that with another witty master in they'll see each other and, and pair automatically you don't have to step in there it'll just do it as long as it sees another one it'll pair what i haven't done and what i need to get time to do this is i'm going to get because i've got four of them so i'm going to get four instruments and just turn them on and see which ones connect to which and see if there's any logic in that or whether it's just like first come first serve so you know the first one first two that are on will pair and then the next and so on so you can't set it to always do that and the same with connecting it to bluetooth on your mac you turn it on the mac says i see it but you need to click connect on the mac for it to then hook up and the yeah. same with um, an ios device you actually kind of need to instigate that connection so once they get kind of like smart connectivity or configurable and program or storable connectivity um maybe that's you know down the line um you know in in the app somewhere you might, might be able to configure it but until they get there it's it's still a little bit you know i've got to turn this yeah. on and then connect that but it's great because I can just plug it in and not have to worry about cables and it and it just works and it's so it's never it's been perfect ever since I've I've got them. Yeah, and then, I mean that's the thing, it's amazing. Thirty odd years even you know, what was mm. it eighty two was it MIDI that came out? Yes. Or whatever how many years that is now, forty years geez. Um the, years, uh yeah. We're still using those DIN cables. <laughs> I know. It's bonkers. It's but bonkers, it's, isn't it? It's you know? a completely unheard of in, in the technology world that a protocol can exist for nearly 40 years virtually untouched. Uh, you know, there's been, yeah. there's been no real massive change to that protocol at all until, you know, the last few years when we've, you know, they've now ratified 2.0. But even 2.0 is fully backwards compatible with one and we've got all this new stuff and that's great but it is it's it's remarkable and you know i've been doing lots of research into um certain things that happened around that time and how midi just uh, mm. it, it made companies because it allowed them it gave them this this ability to build all of this stuff and have it all just work together um as you know and, and it, it was very empowering it was great stuff so that's MIDI. About, you know yeah you know technology and things that well, have been yes, used again. for a long time the quarter inch cable yeah i mean that that's been used for, man mm. many yeah. many decades i mean for musical instruments at least back to the 50s yeah and it's not 40s, just for audio probably, is it 40s mm. yeah yeah telephone wasn't it really? yeah well but... telephone before that mm, yeah. i can think you know leo fender started making electric guitar started doing stuff in the 40s and you know of course guys like les paul and stuff and I think this is, you know, quarter inch cables what they're using. Mm. We're still using them on our, you know, our flagship modern polys and our electric mm. guitars. Yeah. It's, can can you imagine um can you imagine Apple making since they just, they just <laughs> dropped the midi port years ago? <laughs> yeah. Um uh, Ben in the chat just said he recently that, that five pin DIN used to be a German standard for audio equipment and that's exactly right. DIN I think is Deutsche yeah. something something, isn't it? And it's a German thing. But the reason they yeah, chose it was because recorders. Yeah, because it was so mm. common. And of course, when you look at the wiring of a MIDI plug, you've got five pins, but there's only three ever wired up. So it's you know it, it, they just used what was the most common sort of thing, and it's um, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's amazing how long that's lasted. Anyway, um, Ben's disappeared, so let's um, let's say lots of nasty things. No, no, we, we shan't do that. Um, the other thing that. Um, Chris, you, you kind of brought this uh, up. So um, M-Audio have just launched this, which is the um, the Keystation 88, which is a really nice, slim, um, practical 88-note weighted controller. Um, 
and you oh, sorry semi weighted USB mini controller um, very simple um, it's got transport controls on there and uh, yeah it looks rather nice I'm actually thinking um, I know a, a young boy who might want one of those for Christmas um, and you were thinking about um, you know people's preferences with with controllers what what sort of things were you looking to find out yeah uh, so with my setup currently, I don't have a, like a master controller for things. And so I have a mix of hardware and software. Um, and I do use a lot of soft synthesizers for music that I'm recording. And so when I think about what am I going to play into, I've got some great key beds. Um, this has a great key bed. I, the OB6 is my favorite, except that it's short. Uh, the Matriarch has a great key bed. Um, and then I've got some controllers like the X key and the key step. And usually those are what I tend to use with the computer for uh, triggering sounds. And I've always been kind of curious because I've watched, you know, I've seen a lot of different people who have a master controller. Um, uh, Torson was just showing me his setup, and I think he's got something that slides out. I wanted to get your uh, thoughts on it. Now, maybe it would be different if you come from a piano background and something like this one. Um you know, gives you something that feels a little more familiar. So uh, Ben says, Moog one as the master. Yeah, I, I'm not firing that up to run uh, to, to run plugins, <laughs> even if it's Omnisphere. I'm just not going to do it. So, I, I, you know, if I pull out a key step or something for it, or if it's something bigger, something else. But that's the thing. It's like, I, I'm kind of curious about what your guys' setups are when you're recording um, uh, obviously, you know, R Robbie has done his part for the team and has got a big controller <laughs> right behind him just for this week. I mean, yeah, yeah, thank you for that, Robbie. Yeah, yeah you're <laughs> absolutely welcome. Yeah. Um, well, uh, well, maybe Robbie, start us off. Yeah, like, so what, what do you think about controllers and using this? I didn't have one for ages. And then when I was doing uh, stuff for Akai, they sent me the uh, original MPK-40. And I, what am I saying? Of course, my very first keyboard was a controller. Um, completely forgot so um, I dabbled with lots of different things and then eventually when I had enough money I bought a uh, Roland SC88 VL and I needed a keyboard so Evolution who I think then got bought up by M Audio and then M Audio have been bought up by In Music or whoever um, they, there was an Evolution MK49 which was a very kind of cheap plasticky 49 key controller with uh, some buttons on the top and that was it and a MIDI connection and a power socket and that was that uh, and that was that was my keyboard for a little while and then I got a, um, a CS1X I think it was was the next one I, that was a nice 61 note and then you know I was quite happy to use that as a controller for, for a lot for a long while but then Akai sent me the, the the MPK 49 the first one that they did which had the 12 pads on and I thought oh, now this is better because you've got templates for different doors or different instruments, you've got faders, you've got rotaries, um, you've got also you've got transport buttons, you've got the MPC pads. It's like all in one. This is perfect, but it takes up quite a bit of space on on the desk. It's not you know wonderfully you know it's quite a hefty thing. Um, and then I got the Key Lab sixty one, which was nice again because of the integration with the software, particularly the Arturia stuff. Um, it also has the pads, 16 pads, and they light up, so that, that was slightly better. Um, but unfortunately, the key bed mechanism was shite, absolutely shite. Within weeks, I'd got keys just popping up because the little um, key return peg had snapped off inside. And I, I've lost count of the amount of times I've had to open this up and glue those back in to the point where I think now I'm just going to open it up, snap them all, and glue them in because they will be stronger than they were originally. Now, apparently Arturia had knew this problem and offered free replacements. I wasn't made aware of this until long after the event, and I went to them and said, oh, any chance? And they said, oh, we don't make that one anymore, but we'll we'll sell you um, the, the latest version at trade price. Oh, thank you very much. Not. Um, so I've kind of like left it, really. Um, I had a, I've got a Behringer... UMA 25S, which is a little 25 note half distance travel, you know, sort of short travel keys. Um, but it also is a, an audio interface and it's great for traveling. You know, I used to just stick that into the suitcase and, 
uh, you know, I'd be in my hotel room, just that was, you know, it had the audio interface and the control, it was, it was very nice, but not the greatest thing. But I use it a lot when testing, like Fairlight. So I'm playing a Fairlight with a, with a UMA 25S, which is quite interesting. But then I got this, which is the KX88, which is like the, the, the kind of the classic weighted controller from 84, I think it was, it came out. And I've only had it a day and it's one of the most lovely things I've ever played um, because of that, you know, that whole weighted action. But unfortunately it's huge and it's heavy as anything, but it's, it's just really, really nice. But I'm like you, I mean, I've got all these expensive synthesizers. I don't want to be firing them up just to use as a controller. So I, I just kind of stick with the key lab. That's the one that sits on my desk, it's here. Uh, you can hear that horrible springy keyboard. Um, but it's quick, it's convenient, and you know, it, it's there. That's me. Ben, what about you? Is he frozen? Oh no, he's there. He's just not moving very much. He's on Hit mute again. Mute, mute. Jamie, let's. I was saying, oh no, here he is. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm here. Go on then. Don't move much. I'm like a sloth. No, but you're on mute. So anyway, <laughs> controllers, mate. <laughs> Right, yeah. Um, my favourite controller that I've had is, is kind of the rolling version of what you've got behind you right yeah. now. It was the MKB, I think it was called the MKB 1000. Mm -hmm. And it was heavier than my car. I think the wheels fell off when I put it in the back. Um, <laughs> but it was with a, like a chrome stand and, you know, it... it it, it, it was designed to go with all that MKS stuff. Yeah. I think that you'd have all the MKS stuff in a rack, and then they say, "Thousand is a controller for that." The buttons were the same as on the Jupiter Six. It was just a lovely thing. But what really niggled me about it is the velocity was like quite low. So even though you were bashing it out, like when you looked at it in your door, they, they were quite low values. You still get that like dynamics but not to the level that you wanted it to, you yeah. know. So you're constantly going in and editing it, pulling everything up and, and getting it right. And it, it, it did feel a little bit low velocity uh, then. But live, uh, we use, uh, we, we all use uh, the Nectar Panorama P6s. Yeah. And when, when you play those in the house, the action is like the worst action you've ever played in your life. Oh, right. And you just think, this is awful. But it, for some reason, in a live setting, it, it's just like you, you, you glide over the keys. It, it, they're really good, I think, for, for as a live controller. And I think they're, they're the best we've used anyway. Because um, didn't they do uh, dedicated controllers for reason, Nectar? Oh. Am I? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I seem to, to remember that, that they they did this thing where they had you know dedicated reason controllers, so you know kind of direct access functions for, for that door, which appealed to me at the time, but I never kind of got around. But yeah, uh, I, I, I I like the Nectar Live because when when I hook it up to main stage, I basically get a simplified version of main stage on the screen. All oh, right. So I, I can call up all all the programs and that and the. The screen changes. It, it's pretty good. It's a great uh, companion for main stage. Yeah, world. I'm always surprised that somebody hasn't come up with a main stage controller. You know that that yeah. that integrates and gives you that. You know that um, more. Um, yeah, because the popularity of main stage as a live performance tool, it would just make sense. But I guess I suppose if you've got the laptop there. That's all you kind of need. Oh, I don't know. Um, Jamie, are you a controller guy or are you just hardware synths? Yeah. And... No, I don't like the idea of spending money on something that doesn't make a noise. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, That's what I say about um, my wife. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I gigged for 10 years, but I took out synths. Um, so, uh, and that was uh, nothing to brag about. It was cheesy cabaret stuff. Right. But, um, but uh, I can see how it works, though, with, with, you know, for, say, for, like, Ben's band, um, using, you know, rather than taking out synths that can 
you know, get knocked and all that type of things, the original thing, especially when you've got drunk people at the end of the night. Mm. But, um, you know, just using controllers to control main stage, that makes perfect sense. So, but this, it just, your idea there about why haven't they done a controller, that, that makes, exactly, why haven't, why yeah. hasn't someone? Because it's kind of like the industry standard for gigging live, isn't it? Yeah. If you're going to use the software. So you would have thought, yeah, it makes sense to do it. I suppose Novation got quite close, didn't they, with their SL series? Yes. But that meant wrapping around the, um, the the plugins. They had to create a duplicate of the plug- plugins and stuff. So, but yeah, that that that's a nut that still has never been cracked, and uh, maybe never will. I don't know. But um, for me now, I don't. I don't. I'd rather just buy buy an old synth. <laughs> and use yeah. that as a, a controller. Well, EX5, Yamaha X5, that was a perfect yeah. um, keyboard for um, playing um, synth sort of stuff. Well, all, all of those um, Yamaha keyboards... Um, Yamaha keyboards are, uh, were the best, really. And people, people yeah. still use DX7s mm. because they, they're not using the sounds, they just love that action. You know, the DX7, the DX5, yeah. it's the same mechanism in the Korg as well because I think you know they shared a lot of stuff um, over the you know the eighties and the nineties, and they are just immensely lovely they things are. to play. There's there's mm. that sense of there's a sense of feedback and of, of feeling rather than just soft you know spongy continuous kind of stuff. Um, I yeah. just wanted to bring this one up because this this was something I um, wanted to buy and almost bought recently actually, and then I thought, do you know what? I don't have room for an eighty eight note controller. Uh, he says, and now he has one sat behind him. But I'm just trying to find a picture of this. Here we go. Um, has anybody ever played with the Oberheim Viscount MC1000? Because I thought, as a as a an 88 note controller, this looked the dog's leathery bits. Um, because you've got all of these controls um, and this, this little matrix on there that you can use to to set things up. I just they look really you know simple and straightforward i kind of just like that element anybody ever use one of those anyone in the chat i've not used one, i've not used one of those but i have used the um ob12 the uh viscount oberheim collaboration oh, yeah. of the synth and that the build quality on that was less than adequate right really yeah, it was pretty poor. Uh, so uh, even though that might look the part, if if it's anything like the OB12, it'll probably be quite plasticky. And even though the case might be metal, it might be a bit, you know, yeah, crappy knobs and stuff. Um, I I guess I because I was thinking about this in the car yesterday when I was driving home with the KX in the back and thinking, you know, what makes people gravitate to certain key mechanisms because you know you've got certain synths you know that have the traditional synth action which is generally a, a, a constant feel when you when you press the key down there's you know maybe it's slightly spongy maybe there's a little bit of resistance but it's you know kind of a uh, there's no heft behind it but it's certainly not lightweight and then you've got you know those um like you know the yamahas and the Korgs where there's there's definitely a when you press down, you feel there's an initial resistance there, which is a little bit like a hammer action. It gives you a sense of, yeah, I'm actually having to put, you know, it kind of, I guess it allows for a more dynamic performance. And then you've got the, the light airy stuff. I mean, even that fair light, the, the, the first fair lights had this really horrible wafty limp action. It was just terrible. And then you've got stuff with, you know, half travel and, and it, so I guess it whether it's depending on the style of play that you that you know whether you're you know I, I wanted to ask Michael Whalen you know something like this because he does all this you know crazy stuff where his fingers are blurring he's doing all this crazy kind of stuff does he require uh, a certain you know type of keyboard for that can you do that on a weighted keyboard like this or do you need something that's light you know like, what is it I don't know what what makes people choose. I, I th- I, me, me personally, sorry, I, I think that I'm a better player on a weighted keyboard. I've never had piano lessons or anything, but mm. I seem to play better on a weighted keyboard. Um, I, I don't know why that is. It just feels 
more natural uh, and maybe I, I gravitate more towards piano and that's why I'm not getting anywhere with synth mm. music. Yeah. <laughs> now, semi-weight, semi-weight is my thing. I mean, the Moog one's got probably the best I've played because it has a texture on it as well. Mm. Um, I've got, I've, I've had weighted, I had like a Kronos back in, uh, you know, not long ago, well, a while ago. And I need to put bricks on my hands to really play weighted stuff, <laughs> fully weighted. It just, it, it doesn't feel right for me. It's mm. nice for like piano, with a little bit of dynamics in there, a bit of feel. Yeah. Like playing since yeah. that, since that, doing a run down on a weight, a fully weighted art. It's like, it's like little, little, <laughs> my hand gives up. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so no, I, I, semi-weighted for me. Actually, the um, quantum's not bad. Quantum's all right for yeah. a, a keyboard. Yeah. yeah. Keyboard. Yeah. Chris, you you were gonna say something? Sorry. Oh yeah. Um... Well, so much comes down to just personal taste and maybe your history with it because mm. I recall uh, Glenn Darcy talking about um, designing the key bed for the um, Hydrosynth and, and it did a kind of a, a survey of it and they had people play some keyboards and find out they're taking notes about which ones people liked and the results I don't want, want to misquote him but the results were sometimes surprising he found where sometimes what you would expect people would all would gravitate were were not that mm. and and I, I do see that like you know so for the guitar world there's sometimes reasons for changing string gauges and having certain type of action how high the string sits off the fretboard um, and I, I've noticed that players tend, it's especially noticeable with guitar because your tone changes. So the same guitar, same setup, my buddy will come over and it's really dark sounding, real thuddy and lots of bass. And he's playing the same settings and I'll get on there and it'll be very clean and bright and sparkly sounding, but not as much bass. And so that says what that says is that we're holding the guitar differently. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some can you know with this there can be some differences, but I have a softer touch. He's like really aggressive with it. Now I imagine the same thing could be said for for keyboard players as well. And if you have more of a piano background, maybe you would prefer mm. that heavier action. I don't I don't do as well on a heavier action synth. Mm. Uh, in fact, I tend. I, I this does play very nicely, but um, the OV6 actually is the one that I really, or the you, yeah, probably the OV6 is my favorite. It's just the right amount of feel. And but again, why? Why is it for yeah. me that that's the one that's the magical one? I don't know. I used to have this theory that it all it was based on what you first learned to play on. So if you if you if you're taught on a piano. You you had a preference for for the weightier side of things. If you you know if your first synth was a you know mid range, you know or budget synthesizer with a, a fairly you know soft action, that's where where you would naturally gravitate to. I'm not a trained pianist um, at all. I dabbled, but you know I I was I flitted between pianos and synthesizers. But I'm finding that I. I have a preference for a high quality synth action or a weighted action um, because I it, it just I feel I can express more is that I don't know I can I yeah. can be more dynamic um, you know so but I can, imagine I think, for the the type of thing you're playing too like yeah. if you're playing an electric piano sound that EOB6 key bed that I love is probably not the greatest thing it's not going to have the same kind of bounce that you would expect to have. Mm. I th- I also, I think, may- I think... I think that what... I was going to say, because I'm a drummer as well, by, you know, that's my first instrument, maybe I, you know, because I'm, it's all about, you know, how hard you hit things, that a weighted or, you know, a decent weighted action is more preferable to... I don't know. Sorry, Jamie, I cut you off. No, I was, I was going to say some of the worst ones, uh, uh, the Korg, the um, King Korg, <laughs> and <Yep>. the Chrome, <laughs> oh, they're awful. Because you know most synths, or, or you know, they'll have the the pivot point inside the synth itself. Yeah. Whereas, so when you creep up towards the the case, you do your shape. Um, you can still push the key down, but those core ones, they just stop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you it's only get to play like two notes. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hate that. I and then, hate that. then you got the whole after touch thing, haven't you? Because some keyboards, you know, the after touch is is nice and it's kind of balanced, and you you just 
nice gentle pressure and it's some or non-existent or you know some some is yeah really it kind of have to stand on the bloody thing to get it to work um again i'll come back to my arturia because it, it's so light and flimsy that i press the key down and when i go to put after touch the you can see the key actually bends the plastic bends it, and it's just like it doesn't fill me with any confidence whatsoever yeah. whereas on this thing you, you do have to you know give it a bit of oh oomph. yeah but yeah those, rely on that yeah <laughs> but the but the, the those yamaha semi-weighted uh affairs you know that they used on the dx7 it's perfect it's just it's the right balance of you know i just want to lean into it a little bit and i get a, i get a response and i don't have to stand on the bloody thing or it's not you know instant you know like bit, 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 you know it's it's a nice gradual you know articulation so but, yeah uh, osmos what's it called expressive e yes i mean that looks fantastic and i would mm. love to have one of those um but it would be interesting if in a more conventional way uh to see some company really kind of take up the controller market and produce a poly after touch you know several different sizes you know maybe you get a 49 61 73 88 mm. and do poly aftertouch with different actions and i think that would probably a lot of people would find that um you know because we have some companies that did it before i mean a lot of people talk about the yamaha or the kurzweil uh controllers but there doesn't i mean the controllers in the market today are are like your uh well, which one's yours, Robbie? The Arturia? Yeah, the Keylab 61 Mark One. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, that's kind of what we think of controllers these days. Like, eh. Yeah. But if there were some really nice quality ones, and especially yeah. if you're interested in having a, a format, you know, whereas maybe we have a lot of synthesizers sitting around, other people will have a lot of rack synthesizers, tabletop synths, um, uh, and also software. I mean, that's a huge part of the market all those combined to be able to have some really great controllers would be nice and not just i mean we see them at the lower end of of the cost range like with the one we just plugged mm. um the m audio one but uh wouldn't it be great to have some really quality ones again I, and maybe it, maybe the market is not there as much as we think and that's why they don't do it but uh, it, nevertheless it'd be really great to have something that was kind of Almost the build quality of the the Moog One, but was designed to be a a, a, a professional grade controller. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe we can link the two uh, sample and old topics together here, <laughs> and have multiple MIDI outs on it. Yeah. And some sort of internal routing, so yeah. you could you could say well this is good on this particular patch this is going to go to the computer this is going to go over here to, and there, there, there is a market for that you stick a couple of cvs on it as well keep the modular guys happy and yeah you've got yeah. to wear that i think it the... only cost about five five grand and, and doesn't make a sound yeah <laughs> i was i was looking at a controller i thought it was this m audio one but no i think it was a studio logic SL88 something or other. It's like their their latest 88 note controller, and that's got multiple MIDI outs. So I thought, oh, that's that's good because then you it expands the possibilities um, that you that you have. Uh, so yeah, I mean, again, connectivity is an, another thing with you know these controllers. You know, what's it connect? You know, what can you connect to it? Um, yeah, you know, the Arturia ones are designed a lot to work with their software, not necessarily everything else. Although I find that the key lab is is quite easy to use with with, with other um, doors and, and other instruments, but um, yeah, I, I guess there's everyone's got different requirements, and you can't make a controller for everyone's specific thing. Modular, modular keyboards, not Euro rack or anything, but mod. You, know, let, you can build. How about building your own? You, know, you can buy a block. I want an 88 note or a 61 note, so I buy that block, and then I want these controllers. So you buy that, and it it sticks yeah. on or something that would be, be great that would be, be expensive on, i bet <laughs> yeah. the, 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 what are those blocks that we, we talked about the ones that we see in the spitfire audio um things are these little square things with sliders or big buttons on or big knobs on and then you they magnetically stick together yeah um what are they called i forget what they are they're ridiculously expensive for what they are um yeah but 
very nice nice to have well there you go controllers everyone's different and everyone likes something different so yeah human race whatever um and just in case you missed it the m audio this is what kind of spurred this on the m audio 88 uh, Mark III, which is a semi-weighted USB MIDI controller with uh, some nice uh, features and specs. I didn't see how much that was. Did, did we know? Did we find the price oh, of that? Know. Let's see. What was it called? The Keystation 88 Mark III. Let's see if some of the shops have got... There we go. £175. Yeah, 175 yeah. Which pretty is pretty reasonable. It's pretty reasonable yeah. for an eighty-eight. Now, obviously, yeah. because it's semi-weighted, you go for the hammer action. It's it's twice that, um, but that's not bad, I suppose. Hundred and what's that one there? Oh, that's the old. That's the old one. So yeah, um, the Mark Three is one hundred and seventy-five pounds, which is pretty good. Um, so there you go, controllers. I think. Oh, sorry, Sasquatch has just said in the uh, the chat room, roll, Roly Blocks. That's not what I'm... No, that's not the one I'm thinking of. I know what Roly Blocks are, but these aren't those. There's something else. It's uh, the one that Christian Henson uses? Yeah, Christian uses it. Oh! Yeah. They're little silver yeah. blocks, and they kind of magnetically yeah, stick together. Yeah. And you've got you've got options got with faders, faders and buttons, buttons and knobs. And, and big knobs and all, yeah. It begins with a P, I'm sure it does. But anyway, we, we are... Jamie, mate, it's been great to have you on. Thank you ever so much yeah, for, great for doing the long. I bet you're dying for a wee or something, aren't you? Or something to eat at least. No, no, no. I've got a, I've got a little bottle here and a tube. So, oh, <laughs> did that, not, that's where I'm. Did not need <laughs> to know. Uh, no, I'm all right. Did not. No, need it to was know. good actually. If, if um, you know, if people. Sorry, to plug myself, but no, if people want it. to uh, check out what I, I did with um, uh, interview Nathan uh, JLC, he was fantastic, fantastic, yes. and he's so talented. So. Uh, yeah. Please check him out. Yep, please and, do. And uh, that's about it for me. So um, people can find you on uh, YouTube under Geosynths. And, of course, your website, geosynths.com, is where they can buy all of your wares, your sounds right. and patches and everything. Yep. That's right. Yeah, Huge. and there is a 15% sale on at the moment. Oh, so, look at that. Bargain. Know, lovely, yeah. So loads yeah. of great sounds yeah. on that. And, you know, and Jamie is, is damn good at doing that kind of stuff. So um, Really if, good. If you've yeah. got any of those synths, um, yeah, go and, go and buy those because they will... Um, I made a deal with the devil, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you have to wear all red. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come, come that's soon. right. Yeah. I, I, could, I couldn't go down to Georgia. I went to Blackpool instead. <laughs> <laughs> and co coming, coming soon, um, polybrute patches, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Chris, you've got much lined up for this week? coming anything interesting all all the usual stuff so yeah. after you go buy some of jamie's patches buy my patches too and yeah. um just remember goonies never say die indeed oh excellent Cheers, guys ben how about you busy week ahead finishing off the uh, studio well yeah we've um we've had some changes to electro 80s and yes um we've got a new new band member it's maybe me. a change no. Maybe a, a change of name, so that's pushed me forward on the studio build. <laughs> I've got to, I've got to really pull my finger out now, and I've got till Wednesday to get it all wired and up and running. So that's, as you can imagine, that's going to keep me pretty busy. Yeah. Um, and then post Wednesday, I'll be uh, working on new tracks. Cool. So it's all, it's all quite exciting, really. Excellent. New stuff. studio, new lineup. Yeah. Off we go. Just yeah. need to get rid of this virus so you can get out there and play. Oh, no, yeah. It's going to take me ages to get the songs ready anyway. Yeah. <laughs> now, I've got a quick request before we go. I went out yesterday and I, I got a bunch of gear, and in the box was this. I didn't ask for this. This just came with it. So it's called a DigiTalent hand-controlled MIDI. That's it. It's a little kind of, it's like a homemade black box. Now, I know that more than one was made because if you go onto YouTube uh, and search DigiTalent hand controlled MIDI, there are a few videos. It's basically like a D beam, like a homemade D beam. So you've got a power supply at the back, you've got a MIDI socket there that goes into your instrument, and then you've got these two holes that it, uh, I believe it's infrared and you do all this. Now, I haven't got a correct power supply and I don't want to shove anything in there without blowing it up. But I cannot find any information about, you know, how this works. Uh, what, you know, I'm going to uh, uh, unscrew it 
later this week and find out what's inside. But if anybody's got any idea about that, I would really, really like to know. So if you could uh, maybe drop me a line in the ProSynth Network Facebook page, that would be really interesting. Um, because I, I want to try it. I, I don't want to stick a power well, supply in it that that yeah. isn't correct. You know, so I get the polarity. One thing that you could you could check. Mm. Uh, some of the components in there like the capacitors yeah. and find out what the lowest voltage value is you know it's going to be below that you could also if it's dc rather than ac you could check the polarity of the uh the electrolytic caps in there as well yeah. what's going to ground and what's not yeah but yeah so it's probably I, easier for somebody to, to send some information well the thing is i found um some i found something online that said that it came uh, came with a uh, psu of 12 volts so i'm figuring that's um a positive polarity on the tip and 12 volt dc and i tried that and nothing worked but then again nothing went pop so either it's broken or i broke it and it was a quiet break or or it's wrong but um I don't know. I couldn't couldn't seem to get anything to, to work. So if anybody has any information, drop us a line on the ProSynth Network Facebook page, and I'd be really, really grateful. Um, and then I'm going to spend the rest of this week trying to figure out how to rearrange this room and um, where I'm going to put all this this gear. And that's about it, really. <laughs> anyway, um, so thanks ever so much to Jamie for joining us. Again, you can catch his show um, every Sunday at 6, right before hours, and that we know that a lot of you come over. So it's great that we get that kind of cross-pollination. Um, and go and check out his show on YouTube. Go and check out his sounds at geosynths.com. Thanks ever so much for joining us, Jamie, once again. Um, have a great no week, no Ben. Goodbye. See you soon. And Chris, take care and hope everything is uh, calming down over there in California. So we'll see you all same time, same place next week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you.